Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. Alone in the RV. My girlfriend and I spent the better part of last year in an RV. It was pretty dope until the fun came to an abrupt end. We were driving along the 15 in Utah in this stretch of highway that has about 70 or 80 miles between rest stops. We had stopped in the desert a few times before, and we were low on gas, so I was trying to spot a good place to veer off. I searched too long, and the RV ended up running out of gas, so I pulled off into the desert. I had a spare can in the back, so it wasn't a problem. The momentum of the RV took us maybe a 100 yards away from the highway. We came to a stop, drank a few beers, and decided it was as good a place as any to call it a night. My girlfriend fell asleep when night fell, so I decided to use my little book lamp to get some reading done. A few chapters in, I started hearing something besides the wind from outside of the RV. It was a jingling sound like keys. It was getting closer. I sat straight up and my heart started racing. I listened very carefully and then heard it right outside of my window. There was breathing, maybe two feet away from where I was laying. Panting, actually, it sounded like a dog. I tried to reason for a second on why a dog would be out here. Maybe it was hungry. I heard it chewing on something outside. I inched my way up to the window to take a look. In the moonlight, I saw a brown and tattered dog with its head twisted sideways. He was chewing on my tire. I stared for another second, and my head grazed the window. The dog heard it and turned his head up and looked straight at me, right in my eyes. It had this really discerning look of intelligence on its face and it was grinning. Then he took off running into the desert. I almost shit my pants. I suddenly felt very vulnerable in my little RV. What the hell was that dog doing out here? I then also remembered that I had decided to wait until the morning to put more gas in the tank. F that. I sat motionless in bed for maybe a minute or two frozen. Then I felt a surge of momentum, and I got up, put on my pants, and grabbed the bat and gas can with one hand. I opened the door with the other, and I charged for the tank, scanning the horizon with my eyes and ears. I put the gas can down, opened up the tank, tilted the gas can in, and waited. I remember this being the worst. Now that I had to wait for the can to empty, my mind started drifting again. I realized how cold and windy and quiet it was in the desert. I couldn't help but wonder what was out there in the jagged, unforgiving landscape. I wished that I had bought a gun. Then I thought I heard something on the other side of the RV, just faintest sound. I bent down a little to look under the RV, and I saw a children's book on the other side, nestled in the sand. Something about table manners with a kid on the front, about to eat. It was near where I'd put my chair to watch the sunset a few hours before but I would have noticed it then. I dropped that gas can and ran. I threw open the door, and in a flash I was in the driver's seat, turning on the engine. As it started up, I turned to see my girlfriend wake up in the bed at the back of the RV. Sorry, baby, we've got to go, I said. She looked at me and asked why, but then something caught her eye to my right. I saw her face peel back in a terrifying scream. I turned and saw the door had been thrown open again, and there was a man stepping into the RV. He was already looking at me and smiling. He had these awful, jangled, and blackened teeth. I remember now that he also had what I can only describe as a very old bib on. It had some crusty, dark maroon and brown stains on it. I slammed the gas and the RV lurched forward, throwing him out the door. I then proceeded to jam it to the highway. My girlfriend had fainted, and I just drove for an hour or so in silence. She finally woke up. To this day, I let her believe that that horrible man in the RV was just a nightmare. It was rural hill country, Texas, 2005. We had a couple acres of land with the majority of the property, pretty much all but the house, the second house, the shed and the driveway being complete surrounded by trees. 
I am five, got in the back of our family can getting ready to go to the store. My dad was walking from the shed, getting ready to take me and my brother. Nim six. We peek out the back window, looking back at our dad as we see from the right side forest, a large, skinny, solid white creature with long arms and legs run out bipedal. It ran just past our dad. I was young, so bear with me, but it couldn't have been more than 50 feet away. We watched it run and all the way past him directly to our shed where it jumped on all fours and crawled under. It was propped up on concrete bricks, probably about eight inches maximum. My brother and I returned looks to each other, and in our young age, we started crying. We were basically inaudibly crying in the moment, but later on, they claimed they didn't believe us. Almost 20 years later, and my brother and I can still describe in full detail to each other how it was relative to the house and shed and other things. My mother tells me she believes me now. She said creepy stuff happened all the time there. That moment gave me a fear of the outside for a long time. However, if I could, I would like to see it again. I just have to know what it is. Saw some skin crawler stuff, and then saw this sub, and I'm kind of torn between what it is. I was camping near the town of Rogue River in Oregon one night by myself, pretty deep in the woods after my friend's quote, taking his own life, unquote. We'd go camping together quite often, and I felt the need to get out of town and get my thoughts straight. I always slept on the ground in an army bivvy with MSS and the inflatable pad. I always carried while camping as we'd shoot our rifles and get drunk. Well, that night I got my fire stoked and started downing the tequila until I passed out. I woke up with my phone dead and the fire just being embers. I was freezing as I didn't seal my bivy all the way and had my head and upper torso exposed. I called it a good a time as any to puke and piss. I got out of my bivy and walked over to a tree near my camp and undid my trousers. It was very quiet. At night, it's usually quiet, but it was a different kind of quiet. It made me feel very uneasy. I finished up and made my way back to camp, still needing to puke and feeling sobered up, but still messed up. A sense of unease still provoked within me. I grabbed my awk and slung it to make me feel safer as I tried to find some sticks to stoke the fire back to life. My biggest mistake was losing my flashlight deep in my rucksack. I exhausted all the sticks near my camp and got the fire going a little. I started to walk towards the stream that faced south of my camp that had a steep hill that went to a dead part of the forest, which always gave me the spooks. I could have sworn I saw someone staring at me from the top of the hill line. I yelled out to it and it did not move. I freaked out and threatened to shoot it. It still didn't move, so I shot at it a couple of rounds. No ear pro, and so my ears rang like a mother. I had a slant break, so between the flashes and being deaf, I lost sight of whatever was staring at me. It scared the hell out of me, and I do not go camping there by myself anymore. I try not to go hiking there anymore either, at least in the dead forest. It's weird my side of the forest, which is north of the creek, has very good vibes during the day. The South has bad vibes all around. I still have distinct memories of Grandpa Bert's brother from when I was a young child. I was probably five or six the last time I actually saw him. The large-bellied old man gave me a high five before saying goodbye. My grandpa wasn't close to his brother, and my dad tells me that they got into a fight many years ago, resulting in a cold relationship. This is only matters because I found my grandpa's brother's antique bag among his possessions when he passed away. I came across the bag when I was helping clean out my grandfather's old place after he died. My grandmother was absolutely destroyed by the loss. Let me go through his belongings to find sentimentally valuable items. I enjoyed this work and found myself fascinated with the old objects he had collected over the years. 
It wasn't until I nearly cleaned out the place entirely that I found the old black doctor's bag tucked beneath some boxes. The leather holding the bag together was worn and tearing, which gave the bag a very old feel. The outside had the letters LPM embroidered, which were the initials of Bert's brother. I found it puzzling as to why my grandfather would have this because of his relationship with his brother, who had also passed a couple years before Bert. I didn't open the bag until I got home and was happy I waited, because I knew my grandmother couldn't handle its contents. Inside were hundreds of old papers, ranging from bank notes and loans to receipts for purchases in the early 1900s. Among the many fragile papers was a thick stack bound together by a piece of twine. These papers were on a much higher quality parchment and looked distinctly different from the rest of the piles of paper. Upon my careful unwrapping of the twine, I soon discovered they were legal documents for the foundation of a county. To sum up a bulk of the papers, many simply were documents confirming the application for a new county in California. I cannot share which county because it is still around today, but I can say that it is quite small and would be considered relatively unknown. I soon found myself itching to get home from work each day to do more research on the county and scour through the many fascinating documents. Two days I later found three large court documents that caught me completely off guard. The case involved my distant relative of the same last name, the founder of the county, against the state of California. The charges were for manslaughter, negligence, and endangerment. However, it wasn't the charges that were most interesting. No, what really caught my attention was the newspaper article attached to the two court documents. The article read something like this, Update, Critical Condition, and Another Missing. The local county man injured in yesterday's violent incident is still in critical condition after his discovery off 2nd Street. Sheriff Lawrence is declaring a state of emergency for the entire county. This due to the disappearance of Robert Warren, who authorities say went missing after leaving his home late Monday night. Farmers are urged to finish work days before sundown to prevent further incidences. Still no word on who may be behind these terrible events, leaving the county residents in fear over a potential serial killer. The mayor and founder of the county is now being pressed for a lack of action and preparation. I read on and discovered that two other farmers, Jack Bonfield and Shep Lucas, had been attacked on their farms before those previously mentioned. Mr. Bonfield's body was discovered just outside his property line only a couple of days after his disappearance, while Mr. Lucas was said to still be missing from his farm. The writer of the article stressed the vigilance of farmers because they were the ones being attacked on their land. This puzzled me because farmers are usually the most capable of defending themselves. Why would someone target them? There was nothing else in the pile containing the information about the county, and I actually grew upset that I wasn't going to figure out what happened. Internet searches proved to be useless, and I simply had to know what actually happened all those years ago. After nearly tearing the bag apart, I finally found what I was looking for tucked beneath the soft fabric on the bottom. It was just one single paper, but it was at least something. Written on the paper was a letter that was dated three days before the article and began with the words, Dear Mr. Mayor. The writer went on in hardly legible writing. I've been a farmer here since before we were a county nearly ten years, and ain't never seen what I saw two night ago. Mister, this thing was huge. Nearly got off with two of my steers thing was so damn big it dragged them by their hooves nearly fifty yards. I ain't never been one to tell lies or cry wolf. All I'm saying is that you gotta get someone out here. I've talked to the sheriff and he isn't worth a damn. You gotta believe me. Please just do some investigating because I ain't about to lose my farm over something like this. I know you're a good man and will do the right thing. Thank you kindly, Jack Bonfield. My heart caught in my throat when I read the name. It had to be the same Jack Bonfield that was mentioned in the paper. I guess there's only one thing I really know for sure. Something strange happened in that county. Something that needed to be hidden. I personally think Jack did see something.
I also think it was the same thing that attacked the other farmers. What really happened, though, we will probably never find out. I'm crap at explaining things, but I'll give it my best shot. I'm from the United Kingdom. Me and my girlfriend and dog stayed in a cabin on someone's field in North Devon. The farmer's house was about one minute walk away, but apart from that, it was just fields and country lanes, which look like they don't get used very often. The cabin is in a field with a fenced-off park for the dog to roam around in freely around 100 yards of space. Similar to a football pitch, then in front of overgrown field with a lake next to it. I've always been scared of looking out of windows at night. I always shut my window and draw the curtains, etc. It was around 2 a.m. when I heard movement outside, quite heavy sounding. I know there's badgers or deer in the countryside, so didn't really take any notice until I heard it brush against the cabin. Maybe a deer was sniffing or scratching against the cabin. Then I heard a quiet grunt, but sounded very deep-sounding, followed by a breathing sound, which was quite fast. Did not sound like a deer, etc., as I can't imagine their breathing to be deep and quite fast. I led there, still trying to make out what could be a couple yards away from me on the other side of the wooden wall. I hear walk off around the back of the cabin, then come back right outside my window. And I mean literally right outside, but I couldn't see anything through the curtain as it was. Really thick. Then the worst sound I could ever imagine happened, tapping on my window. This did not sound like anything I've heard. It sounded like whatever was tapping the window was really hard, like what tapping a knife on glass would sound like. I literally froze and put the blanket in my mouth to make my breathing quiet. It tapped again, and then nothing for a few seconds. Before I heard the kitchen window get tapped, then the bathroom window. I knew this wasn't a dream, because I near enough had a panic attack and was sweating. It stopped after the bathroom window, and I heard a running away, followed by a shrieking sound in the distance, getting further and further away. After that, I just led there, still not wanting to move or make a sound. It was like it just come over to have a nose and see what was what. Any ideas what this could have been? A goose in Chevlon Canyon in Arizona. I don't think I've ever run like that with a full backpack on before or since. Also screamed like a little girl. Serious answer. Also in Chevlon. Spent an entire night in the mid-1990s with my back to a tree, listening to a large animal moving around. I had a flashlight with me, but it was pretty crappy, and all I could see were eyes looking back. Had my dog with me, and she was growling and barking the whole night. Clearly something out there, and I'd seen bear sign the evening before. When morning came, the large animals proved to be elk grazing in the meadow around me. Oh boy, get way out in the wilderness and you'll find some crazy stuff. While hiking out in the Six Rivers Forest, I found a circle of standing stones about 30 feet across with a four or five foot mound of bones and carcasses in the middle. I never went back, but I have the site logged in my GPS. Another time I was hiking on a logging road and heard a crunch from a little ways into the trees. Figured it was a deer and kept walking, turned around again to see if it was a deer and maybe like 15 feet behind me was a mountain lion that had been following me. I very carefully turned to face it and backed away. Fortunately for me, she followed for a bit but then left. I assumed she had cubs nearby and was making sure I wasn't a threat, but boy howdy those things are too quiet for how big they are. Yet another time I was hiking in the Sierras over Silver Pass and found most of the first one-third of a horse, just absolutely eviscerated in the middle of the trail, bear prints everywhere, claw marks all down the horse bits. My first reaction was, wow, followed by that bear probably wants to finish this horse later, and I hightailed it out of there. When I told the rangers at the other end of the trail, they remarked, not again. 
There's also countless times I've been in a tent or bivy or camping cowboy style and coyotes or bears or etc. come snuffling through camp in the middle of the night. It's terrifying the first few times, but really they want your garbage, not you personally, so as long as food and waste are packed correctly, it's never been a problem for me. I lived in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. The date was June 1, 2013. I used to wake up at 3.30 a.m. to take a bath and then go on the enclosed porch where I could watch the news and have coffee before I left for work on the day shift. While I was sitting on the couch watching TV and drinking my coffee, the TV glitched and a slight wind picked up. It was kind of a balmy morning, so I had the main door open with the screen door closed and the bottom of the screen door to ventilate the porch. Something drew my attention to the door, and when I looked at the glass portion of the window, I saw some type of entity. It looked like I had big eyes and a hand. I quickly took a photograph, and it disappeared in about a minute. After that incident, I was always nervous to sit on the porch. One morning it was raining out, and I had the door open. I looked up, and somebody's dog came and peeked his head in the door. Scared the heck out of me. I was a military policeman in the United States Army. I have been a police officer for almost 15 years. So I was hesitant reporting this, but maybe you can shed some light on it. So, I've been thinking a lot recently of a session I had with a couple of friends in an Ouija board three years ago. I used to believe in spirits and be really into the occult, but this experience kind of spooked me away and I don't know what I believe right now. Well, here's the story. Let me know what you make of it. So, I was with three or four friends in a girl's basement. We were all into the occult and supernatural stuff and brought out the Uija board to mess around. We contacted a spirit. She said she was good and asked her what her name was. She said Emily and Six. We asked a couple of random questions and treated her like we would a real six-year-old. Then someone got the idea to ask her how she died. Big mistake. And she spelled out, Um... At this point, I thought I recognized the spirit and took my hands off the board. I kept asking questions that I knew the answer to, and if this spirit was the girl I thought she was, she would too. I asked if she had siblings, and she said yes. I asked what color her house was, and she said blue. Then I asked what street she lived on, and she said Loomis. All of these answers lined up with a murder that happened in my town, Naperville, Illinois. In 1999, I used to live a mile or two down the road on the same street. We were officially creeped out, but not to be rude. We asked her to leave, and she said she didn't want to. We told her to please leave and that she can't stay, but that we wish her the best. On our way up from the basement, the old playroom that my friend hadn't used in years was wide open with a few toys out of their box lying on the floor like they were just used. It still seemed that she left, though, because my friend never mentioned anything weird going on in her house. This happened about an hour ago. My family was in the car since we came back from a restaurant, but a couple of hours before, my dad and two brothers were in London exploring. We came across a man who was doing some tricks with a ball and three cups. If you were able to find out which cup had the ball inside, you would win the money. In the car, I asked my dad how did he think the trick was done, and he honestly didn't know and was struggling to explain how the man could have done it. I told my dad how I I thought the man did it, and as I did, I saw my mom in the rearview mirror, smiling, but the smile wasn't ordinary. It was sort of sinister. I didn't think much of it and went back to using my phone. After a minute, I looked back at the rearview mirror and realized something. How could I have seen my mom in the rearview mirror? If she was sitting in the passenger seat, I could only be able to see my dad, who was driving in front of me, and my brother, who was behind me. The car is a seven-seater. 
I asked my mom if she was smiling at me, and she said she hadn't even looked up from her phone on a while. I told her that she did, and she denied it. I believed her because there was no way I would have been able to see her unless she was driving or sitting behind me. What the hell was that smiling at me? I wouldn't call it creepy, more like fascinating to watch. Once while tied up for a hurricane, I watched the storm surge coming in. It took a few hours before the storm was on top of us, and all the while there was wildlife scurrying around in a panic in the woods where we were tied off. The deer probably got out the earliest. There were sightings of rabbits, raccoons, squirrels, and other wildlife you would expect to see on the Gulf Coast, but they didn't stick around long. The ones that stuck around began spending their time swimming. So basically, I was on a boat surrounded by muskrats playing in the rain, and they seemed to be having fun until the strongest wind started coming in. By that time, all the lines we were using for moorings were beginning to go underwater from the surge. The hurricane came in, did. Its thing then passed, and the winds and rain started calming down. That's when I saw the things I would describe as fascinating. Boils of snakes floating around us, literally thousands of them. Some of those boils would come alongside our boat, and the crew members were quick to push them off when they started trying to climb up. Most of them were garter snakes, but who wants to take a chance with them, right? I saw piles of alligators floating by on driftwood, some trapped alongside us, just sitting there patiently waiting on the water to recede. So many frogs, I would guess, beyond many thousands that were picked up by the wind were on board. We were moving a 900-foot tow, and there were so many frogs you couldn't see the upwind side of it because so many frogs were clinging to it. I was still catching and releasing rogue frogs from the bilge months later. When the muskrats returned from wherever they were hiding, they seemed to want to take a shot at getting on board, too. Some managed to. Needless to say, we made it a point to keep all outside doors closed for a few days unless we absolutely needed to open one. I work on an oil exploration ship all around the world. I often go out onto the helideck at night to watch the stars and generally escape from the fact that I've pretty much been in prison for the last several weeks. One night in particular stands out to me. We were working in the North Sea about 200 miles offshore Norway. A heavy fog enveloped the vessel with the deck lights creating an orb of light only a few meters in diameter. When I stepped out onto the helideck, I noticed a strange sound all around the vessel. I stood silently and waited for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The orb of light spread as my eyes adjusted and I soon saw what was making the racket. Tens of thousands of sparrows were circling the vessel. A constant stream of them flowed past the lights. I stood there for about thirty minutes in complete disbelief at how surreal it was. Also, I was incredibly thankful it wasn't the shrieking eels. Oregon coast, about three miles out from Tillamook Bay. I was on a huge sailboat with some friends when out of Knoll, where a smell came like you have never smelled. A thousand farting Satans could not have produced such a horrible smell. No matter where we went, this dense, rotting fish smell saturated the air. Well, after a few hours of this, we had enough and turned sails to head in. Well, not 400 yards due east of our heading was something large bobbing in the water. Turns out someone cast a fishing net into the ocean and wrapped up a large barrel and either a whale calf or a walrus. It was horrible. I can still taste it today. I've told this before. On a camping trip about a year ago, I woke up to a howl in the middle of the night, deep in the distance, so it had an echo to it. Now this is Pennsylvania Cook Forest, to be exact. I spent a lot of time alone in the woods as a hunter, camper, hiker, and I never heard anything like this. 
The only thing I can attribute it to was the sound you would think a monkey howling in the jungle would sound like. We were camping near a place that had pet deer, but I know what deer sound like. This noise scared me. Three months babysitting and mansion in the middle of nowhere and renovation. I was there to keep urban explorers out the building. And others. It was far removed from any kind of civilized world. The nearest small village and gas station was approximately 80 kilometers, 50-ish miles, away. First six weeks was fine. I was kind of bored and felt lonely at times. But I could always find things to do and or went exploring the surroundings myself. Week eight was when I noticed some small mental changes. I had conversations with myself. Week nine, ten, I began seeing things in the distance. I was sure a person was observing me from the tree line. It creeped me out. I maneuvered around the house trying to sneak up the intruder and confront him. Turns out it was just a bush moving due to the wind. The weeks after I became a bit unpredictable, a roller coaster. Still haven't seen a single person. No phone line, no television. No human voices. I could go from euphoric to depression within an hour and visa versa. My behavior became stranger. I had trouble falling asleep. Found myself walking around drunk middle of the nights through the woods. Yelling and singing. Would you please shut the F up? We're trying to sleep here. I people, here, where, I located their camp, didn't approach just yet, since they wanted to sleep, they made that perfectly clear. I only slept that night for three hours. I was so excited to have some human contact again. Six in the morning, it was getting light again, and I jumped out of bed, went to their location. They were awake, and I greeted them, went in for a talk. Surely they thought I was a bit weird, but it was just because I really missed human contact for ten weeks now. I couldn't care less who it was. Just someone to talk to that made all the difference. Week twelve, I finally went home. I would never do such a thing again. Thought, oh well, easy money, don't have to do shit. Just babysit this luxury mansion and renovations well. It wasn't so easy after all. It's mentally rather heavy. I, 17 female, had a creepy encounter the night I'm writing this. My parents opened up a haunted house in my dad's shop, and we had a few actors. Names were obviously changed to their role. The actors were me, my dad, my mom, my sister, bear, ghost face, cheerleader, alien prisoner, doll, and skeleton. I know it's a lot. Let me explain how the setup was. The shop has a store in the front, a gym in the middle, storage in the back. Dad would lead the patron into the storefront and ring the bell to let us know to get ready. Then the patron would pass Bear and Ghostface. Then they would get jump scared by cheerleader, me and prisoner, and then pass through the rest. Alien would follow them. Simple. So when we were near the end of our time, Dad let in a guy. You know, like normal. I don't want to profile him, but he seemed to be of Arabic descent or Muslim because he seemed to be wearing his clothes. He should be known as Creepy Guy. I think now I should mention most of us are minors. Sister Bear, Ghostface, and Skeleton are middle schoolers and cheerleader. Alien and I are high schoolers. Creepy Guy touched Bear's shoulder and almost pulled a knife on Bear and Ghostface. After he passed them, he didn't nut his cheerleader, but grabbed Alien and scratched his arm. After that, he stared at Prisoner and ignored me. He then started speaking in a different language. It sounded like chanting, but I don't know, toward Skeleton, Doll and Sister. Mom then ran him off. We were on edge for the rest of the night. I have three theories. Theory one. He was a druggie commonplace in my town. Theory two. He was a really religious man praying over us. Theory three, he was cursing us. I'm leaning towards two, but it was still creepy.
I used to work at a small startup that had a small warehouse in the city. I enjoyed it because it had great benefits, perks, and a pretty easy commute. I just walked a few blocks to the metro line in our city. Usually I worked the day shift, so my walk to the station wasn't too bad. I just encountered normal city life. On the occasional time I worked into the night, I usually walked with some co-workers I knew or my then-boyfriend would pick me up. If I had to make the walk by myself, I'd wear giant headphones to deter catcalls and other annoyances. I had a doctor's appointment that morning and was allowed to make up my shift by staying after the day shift crew left. However, I finished my shift before the rest of the evening crew, which meant I made the walk by myself that day. It was already dark, and the street was pretty much deserted, except for this one really tall, burly dude walking just ahead of me, yelling into his phone. I had my headphones on, but nothing playing because I wanted to be aware of my surroundings. Big, burly guy sounded angry and didn't turn back to look at me until after he yelled into the phone. I did my part, and now it's up to you to get rid of the body. I don't care what you do, just make it disappear. Then he turned around and stopped walking, looking at me, surprised. I quickly stopped to not run into him and give an awkward grimace or smile, acting like I hadn't just heard him say that because I was listening to music. At the next crosswalk, I quickly crossed the street. He just stared, standing in place until I was a block away, and then turned the corner and disappeared. I don't know if this guy actually knew I was behind him and said that to scare me because he thought I was listening into his conversation. I hope, or he was up to no good. But that was super creepy. Never walked to the metro when it was dark after that by myself. Either had a ride a buddy to walk with. The story takes place in Pleasant Hills, Pennsylvania, Allegheny County, south of Pittsburgh. I grew up there and had a friend who lived about a mile and a half away from me. We didn't drive back then due to poor decision making, so we had to walk everywhere. I'd walk down past the local borough building, cut up through the woods, and come out on the other side. It was a shortcut to bypass the huge hills we'd have to walk up. The beginning of the hill started in Pleasant Kingdom, a playground for kids that sits back off the road in the woods with tennis courts, basketball, and typical ground stuff. We used to sled ride there because the hill was pretty massive on the backside. That hill led to the opening of our shortcut. We were walking to my house one night, and we were almost clear of the woods. It was pitch black but we could see the playground lights at the bottom about 100 yards away when we heard a disgusting sound to our right. It sounded like something was eating something else and making crazy wild animal noises, but with a human undertone. I could hear the tree limbs shaking, but could not see anything. We bolted the last 100 yards downhill to the bottom and scratched our heads. We had no idea what it could have been but thought it might have been a bear. We weren't into Bigfoot back then, so it never crossed our minds. The only light was coming from the parking lot lights. It was me and my friend Steve and Jose. Josie was good at fist, fighting, and we were basically afraid of nothing, especially when we were together. We were just about to turn the corner to walk the path behind the borough building to my street. For whatever reason, we all looked over our shoulders. Steve said, WTF is, is that? We all saw it walk across the pavilion, upright from left to right and hide behind a tree. It was about 100 yards approximately and up the hill in the dark, but the light from the parking lot illuminated it enough that we could all see a tall gray-colored animal or man walk across the pavilion. Its head was level with a pavilion roof, easily eight feet tall. We stood and watched and then it simply peeked out from behind the tree, as if to get its eyes on all of us. At that moment, we all turned and ran as fast as we could to my house. We stopped short and looked at each other and asked, why are we running? It's like it telepathically jumped into all of our minds and said, boo, and made 38-year-old men turn and run like babies without even knowing what we had just seen. None of us knew what it was, but it bothered us for weeks.
Until one day, Steve said, I think I know what we saw, and said Bigfoot. It clicked immediately. I knew right there that I wasn't crazy and that we had definitely seen and heard a Sasquatch. I would tell people, my family and friends, and nobody believed us, but it affected me enough that I would join the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. I would go on investigations to interview witnesses of reports, take pictures, and walk the sites. I have a lot of pictures still from some of the interviews I was on. I came to realize that Pleasant Hills is built on abandoned coal mines, and to find out that they travel the mines to stay out of sight. Pleasant Hills is not a rural area. There are houses and neighborhoods everywhere, but there are large woods between the three towns that separate each other. This is the main reason people had a hard time believing my story. I know what we saw. Steve and I are both still very much into Sasquatch. I need to just get this out. I grew up surfing in Southern California. In the summer of 1991, me and my friend were in the water for 30 minutes, and he told me he touched something and felt sick. He went back to the beach. Two days later, he said a doctor told him he had sickle cell anemia. Okay, the last we really talked about it, we were 15 years old. But I still remember, he said, I touched something. Six years later, I was in the water, and something felt weird about the whole day. Then it happened. The pain started with the slightest touch on the inside of my forearm. So bad my hearing and sight were interconnecting and started a confusion beyond any control. All of a sudden, a change in my body began. Cold, freezing muscles and nerves from my toes up my legs to my lower back. The pain worsened and hallucinations of an iceberg, bales of hay, pine trees, and even a little action figure that seemed so real it almost was like trying to be a hero. Then the creature I touched beneath me almost seemed to say, this is my planet, and just swam teasingly below me. A voice with the message, we are thousands of years old. It rang right through all this, almost hypnotic, like with no remorse. I then got a vision of a female, mermaid, light creature. Just take it. I said to myself, nothing even close to this has ever happened to you. The speed at which it was happening was unbelievably fast and precise. I thought of fainting or dying, which seemed possible, but I could still move and swim, which made it feel like it was like a test of will. Then a sudden change in my brain and my spine felt as if it was totally and completely connected and moving together. All of a sudden I felt it, what I thought was causing all this trauma. First it spun a web between my spine and skin on the very lower back as I tried to stretch it out. It started another above, but slower and with a different pattern that almost felt like it protected the first one. This put me into an almost hypnotic state as I felt it crawl up into my neck into the front right side of my brain and sit. It wiggled its legs and body, then turned to the right. The only thing I could think at that point was if I was crazy, I might have killed myself. All this is still within 15 minutes. Then my stomach began to feel numb and cold with my intestines slowly numbing. My right hip socket and femur started to act up. I could feel the whole thing precisely as it was evolving. Three little squares made an appearance to me, each like a growth, and to the exact make of my femur, the three squares attached my hip socket. This caused another hallucination, a doll action figure that had cloth clothing and detachable limbs. All are still within a 30-minute time limit. It stopped and I got out of the water. Later I learned that the clothed action figure was over 200 miles away, as if the, the whole experience was that large and planned out. When I thought it was over, or fading away, it told me differently. This is as real as it gets. Please let me know if you have any research on this. It happened many years ago to me, and I'm reliving it as I am becoming more normal. I have not contacted anyone because of my hypnotic state. I believe that was touched and communicated with a mermaid.
This took place on November 15, 2012. I'm about to relay a story that few of you will believe. No, I'm not on drugs. I'm not kidding at all. Not one bit. If you disbelieve my eyes, do me a favor and keep it to yourself. I know what we saw. Has anyone ever seen a military craft like this? In the dome is a swivel seat in which I saw who I believe was a United States Marine pilot in a green pressure suit with no helmet. It sounded like a diesel train. Just before I saw it, there was a series of twister-like rotational updrafts off in the distance. It was capable of changing the bearing without changing the direction it faced. It can travel very low to the ground. When I saw it, it was about 200 feet in the air. The pilot noticed me, flew within one eight mile close to me, nearly hovering in one spot at one point, and then headed off into the commercial flight lines with an incredible capacity for acceleration, and was easily capable of speeds approaching what I considered to be a thousand miles an hour. I was in Vancouver, Washington and the location I was at had a reasonably decent view of the flight lines that go to the coast, whereupon I normally watch the planes alter course and head north to Canada or south to California. It reached the point of breaking south within 30 seconds and then simply disappeared into the night. It's definitely a UFO to me, but at having seen the pilot, it was unmistakably a decorated military pilot at the helm. The height of the fuselage was about 10 feet tall, 15 feet wide at the nose and 40 feet wide at the widest point through the stern. The pilot was about 30 years old, had dark hair and a military haircut, sitting in a pivot-style chair. The craft flew such that the stern was angled up from the elevation of the nose. I can't recall if I saw the bottom of the craft, but I remember wondering where the diesel train sound was coming from, and then I saw this in the air. I do not recall specifically any lights on the bottom of the craft, but due to the angle of the craft, the low proximity to the ground, and the distance away from me, I could not even see the bottom of the craft. I had someone with me at the time, and she saw this craft as well. The surface of the craft had a look of corrugated metal which would be used on an overhang for a backyard deck along the sides of the craft, and a flat mat of gray upper surface. The dome provided a 360 view of the surroundings. It was positively the most advanced aircraft I have ever laid eyes upon. I began experiencing anxiety, fatigue, insomnia, periodic headaches, unexplained cuts, scars, rashes, and bruises. I began having strange, confusing flashes of memory. At first, they were just a terrifying jumble of fragmented images, sounds, and sensation. After a few years of thinking, I was starting to crack up. They eventually started to come together and become more distinct and orderly. At this point, I have a pretty clear memory of what happened. It usually happens around 2 a.m. or so. If I'm asleep, I wake up in a panic, unable to move. All my hair stands on end, and I feel an odd sensation, almost like an electrical charge flowing through me. It's very difficult to breathe. A blinding light shines in through the windows, and tall, thin figures are standing all around me. I start hearing their thoughts in my head, usually something like, don't be afraid, or there will be less discomfort if you stop trying to resist. I raise off my bed, float outside, and raise up into the light. Here is where things vary a bit. Sometimes they just do some kind of scan. Other times they perform surgical procedures. I can remember having my head clamped in place, and needles or other instruments inserted into my skull, ears, or up my nose. Other times into my forearms or abdomen. At some point I lose consciousness and find myself back in my bed. I know there was at least once that they came when I was awake. It happened three years ago in mid-September. I couldn't sleep, so I was watching Netflix on my computer. Next thing I know, I'm waking up the next morning. I remember thinking how odd it was that I didn't remember going to bed. I made my way down the stairs where I noticed the door was open. I found my rifle laying on the front step next to three ejected rounds. 
all three still intact, except that their primers had been struck. So far, I have not regained the memory of what happened that night. I'm not 100% sure this is related, but I just had to re-shingle my roof. I only put the new asphalt shingles on about three years ago, and they already started curling up and crumbling. They appeared to be scorched. When I was a young man, there were these things. I don't know if this was a dream or what, but it was constantly happening to me. These creatures would come into my room, and I would refer to them as babies. They were tiny little three, foot-tall creatures with heads that looked like pickaxes. Reminded me of the alien films, but not as frightening. Totally black-colored, like night black. The thing that got to me was that some of them had paper sacks with large, big black eyes. And like a few years ago, I saw that book, the cover of a book by, I think, Whitley Stryber, Communion. I don't know if that's what it was, but it scared the heck out of me. I don't know if that's what it was, but these things would come into my room at night and surround me, and they made this weird noise. It was kind of like a deep snarl but it was all out of sync, like there was a lot of them doing it. It was kind of like a weird breathing through your teeth noise. Some of it sounded like it was coming out of an electronic box or something. I only told my parents and one friend about it. It was like 18 or 19 years old. I can remember way back then it was always at this one old house that we lived at in Madison, Wisconsin. It's never happened after that. I think my parents just shrugged it off as, you know, whatever. I used to wake up on the floor under the bed sometimes. I don't remember getting there, but heck if I know. Guess I'll never know what it was. After I read Straber's books and stuff, I tried to think of any weird missing time type of thing or anything like that, and I can't think of anything that's happened since then, so it might have just been a type of dream thing or something. Who knows? I'm 30 three right now. Maybe I'm better off never finding out. My story happened so long ago, I'm not sure I even had children at the time, so it had to have been over 25 years ago. At the time, I was convinced our house in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania was haunted because of other strange things that had happened there too tired to type the rest of the story. It is too long to type, but can share some of the other odd things another time. A friend and I were sitting in a room upstairs that was my living room at the time. She had been visiting. I wonder if she remembers this event, as at the time she was not in touch with this side of her that she now is aware of. Anyway, we were just hanging out, and we both saw what I call the mist come up the steps, and at the top landing it formed into a human shape. The closest description I can come up with is the look of beaming to places on Star Trek. As soon as I looked directly at it, it whooshed out of the human shape and into what was currently our upstairs bedroom, sort of like the lines of flight. I don't remember any sounds, but I remember feeling pretty creeped out and cold. The next, and only sighting, I had with that pixel-type figure was in my basement about 10, 15 years later. I actually put my hands in front of me because I felt I was going to run into it, and it just vanished into thin air. You know that feeling that you get if your eyes are closed or you are blindfolded and you can sense something in your personal space. That's how it was. This happened on March 13, 2017. My fiancé was out running errands, and I was home alone with our two kiddos. No big deal. It's just a regular day. I'm doing the dishes. I'm all wet and soapy, and wouldn't you know it, my daughter dumps a huge, ginormous bag of men in, sir. If you know how men miss are, they get in every little nook and cranny, like every little corner crack and crease. Like they are just everywhere. So here I am, all soaked and wet, and I need to start picking up these M&Ms. So I'm on my hands and knees, 
getting them out of every little crack I can, putting them in a pile so I can sweep them up, and then throw them in the trash. Meanwhile, while I'm picking up these M and Miss Miss my phone, my house phone starts ringing off the hook like someone keeps calling me and calling me. And I'm like, y you know what, whatever. My hands are full right now. I'll get back to them. My caller ID will pick it up, and I'll be able to see who called, and I can call them back. If not, they can leave a message. No big deal, right? So I get them all in a pile, and I pick up the phone to see who called, to see if it was an emergency, because they were calling nonstop. I thought it was going to be the same person calling again and again, trying to get a hold of me. Well, it ended up being my grandma, my dad, and my fiancé. So I saw there was a voice message. So this is where things get weird, but I, I don't know it yet. I don't know what's weird yet. To me, everything's normal. So I call my voicemail, and I'm listening to the message. The thing about my voicemail is that it, it will say, Message from blah, 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 and then it says their phone number. And then it says my grandma's phone number, and then I hear my grandma's voice. So I'm listening to her message, and literally halfway through, I hear my fiancé's voice. And I'm like, hello. And I'm like, really weirded out. We had this conversation, and in my head, I didn't even tell him that it's weird that I got randomly connected to your phone call because I was in the middle of listening to voice messages. Normally, when you take another call, you have to hit a button to go to the next line, but it automatically connected me, so I'm like, whatever, and we talk, and that's that. When I was on the phone with him, I explained to him all about tampons. Took him all through what different sizes, brands, and all that. And I told him what size and brand to pick me up because I needed some tampon. So I hung up, and it's fine. I didn't listen to the whole message, obviously, because I got cut off. And I didn't even think to call back to listen to the whole thing. I go back to doing what I'm doing. I get dinner ready and stuff, and this is when I find out the day turned into a really weird day. So my fiancé comes home, and he brings in some bags. I'm looking in the bags, putting stuff away, and I'm like, Hey, where are those tampons I asked for? And he's like, What are you talking about? So now I'm like, You know when you called me, and we had a conversation, and I told you all about tampons and what kind I wanted. He was like, No. He looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm like, No, we talked. And he's like, no, we didn't, Amber. I called the house one time, and you didn't answer or call me back. And I'm like, yeah, but okay. So I just dropped it because I'm already looking pretty crazy, right? So I got his cell phone, and I looked through the call log, and he was right. He only called me one time, and I didn't answer, so it hit me. It dawns on me later in the night that, hey, you know what? I never did finish listening to that message my grandma left me. So I called the voicemail, and I listened to the message, and it went through my grandma's phone number, that it was from her. It says her phone number, and then it starts the message. Partway through her message, I heard my fiancé's voice on the voicemail, and our voicemail had recorded that conversation that never happened, and it recorded his whole half of it. So when I would talk, it was just silence. But I heard his end of the conversation. The end that supposedly never happened, you know, and I put it on speaker and let him hear it. We were pretty spooked. It's freaky. For me, this whole time, I thought it was normal. But then when he got home, now listening to it, like, no, it really did happen. I'm not crazy. I didn't imagine that whole conversation. So it was like proof, you know. In one way, it's like, yes, I'm not crazy. But in another way, it's like, well, what happened? It's creepy. Like what could possibly happen where in my reality we had this conversation? But in his reality, we didn't. It's freaky. Long story short, my dad passed away in 2019. He was a local legend of a man, a crusty, harsh, hardcore old mountain man. 
When he passed, he had two small children that he was raising on his own, as their mother had pretty much abandoned them after getting cabin fever and falling into addiction. They lived totally off, grid in an area that is snowed in for eight months of the year. Anyways, when he died, I adopted the boys and have been raising them as my own. I'm their 48-year-old half-brother. So, that's the backstory. The kids are doing great, by the way. But I kid you not, Dad keeps visiting all these relatives and townspeople in their dreams. These are people who have no contact with one another. They always reach out to me to tell me the same thing, that Dad visited them in their dreams and had some sort of urgent message for me. They weren't sure what it was, just that he's been desperate to get to me, and I won't answer. It's the same mutual dream over and over, among random people who don't know one another. Honestly, I'm a little freaked out. He wasn't exactly the nicest person to me, so I'm not thrilled with the idea of him reaching out from the great beyond with a message for me. Over the years, I've come to expect these messages from random, unrelated people, and I've never told anyone about this. I had a mild stroke earlier this month, and man, oh man, the old man must be desperate to get a message to me since then, because it's ramped up a lot this month. Hopefully, he's just trying to tell me to slow down and take better care of my health, because Lord knows he didn't. Well, we know how that turned out. But knowing the old man, he's probably pissed that I sold his beloved unabomber cabin or something instead of giving up my life moving in and raising the kids there, removed from civilization, which was his expressed desire. I'm without question that his soul is not at rest with that. His friends usually tell him in their dreams that the kids are doing great and that he can rest now, but he sure doesn't seem to want to. Ever since I was a young boy, I always dreamed of being a park ranger, patrolling campgrounds and chatting with some of the friendly campers, hiking trails to make sure everything was easily maneuverable and just spending time in nature. Being in nature has always been my way of disconnecting from reality. Whenever things got stressful in life, I would hit the trails or go backpacking for a few days or rent a campsite in some remote area in the woods. My parents were never supportive of my goals. They would much rather seen the letters M.D. after my name or my face on a billboard advertising towards people who were involved in traffic collisions. Oh, well, I put in an application for one of the county parks near my house, not really expecting much out of it. I was fresh out of high school, no college experience yet flipping hamburgers and dealing with people who find a reason to complain and everything, so there was no harm at all in putting out applications. I pulled up a Google map directory of every local, state, county, and national park in my state, California, and submitted applications wherever I saw openings. I even called a few parks that I really liked to see if they had any positions available, but hadn't any luck for months. My bank account was starting to dwindle as a result of constant maintenance on my 3 Civic, which had been put through more than the manufacturers could ever design the cars to experience, and I was starting to stress. I would pinch my pennies together at gas stations, skip meals altogether when I didn't have anything readily available at home, and try to cruise 55 on the freeways to be more efficient with what little fuel I had. I definitely didn't expect this to be my reality after high school, but I guess I should. Uh, my parents kicked me out the minute they found out I was gay, and I was left living in my car for months until I found someone who would let me crash on their couch. It was really mentally challenging just trying to convince myself to keep going through everything, but I had this gut feeling that things would work out eventually. I know it sounds kind of weird, but this life wasn't half bad. I mean, I saved a fair bit of money on rent because Dylan let me sleep on his couch at night for free. I took my Civic with me wherever I drove. To the beaches, the forests, and mountains east. The deserts. Sleeping in the car wasn't too bad. I wasn't exactly the most picky camper in the world and knew that it was cheaper than renting a hotel every night. 
Eventually, I'd have loved to get a van or in Suv to have more room, but for now the rusty bucket of problems we call a Civic would have to work. I remember the day that I got the email. I had just checked my bank account balance to see that I had $7.80 left. I was a few thousand miles over when I should gotten my oil changed, and my front brakes were squeaking again, most likely as a result of the axle leaking grease and corroding them. Like I said, rusty bucket of problems. An email was in my inbox that read, National Park Service. Immediately hiring full-time ranger must be willing to relocate. Base salary, 65000 Respond for info. I'd never been a religious lad, but this felt like a godsend. I'd never seen more than $5,000 in my bank account at one time, let alone 65000 a year. As a base salary... Of course, I had to reply to them and send a message that read, Hi there, I'm Jake, a wilderness enthusiast based in California. I'd love to learn more about your opening with the National Park Service. I am willing to relocate wherever, although it might take time for me to get there. Let me know if you'd like to interview me. I attached a copy of my resume, which had a fair bit of information that would have proved I was the right candidate for the job. Ample experience in the wilderness, knowledge on most survival skills, excellent physical shape, good worth ethic. I had beefed up my resume as much as possible. I don't know if I would have been able to forgive myself if they said I was unqualified or didn't get the position. That wouldn't have been an issue, though. About 24 hours later, I got a response from a woman by the name of Abigail inviting me to do a tele-interview a day later. I started to feel giddy with excitement at the prospect of finally landing my dream job with the National Park Service. Not only that, but having accommodation, stable income, and being able to spend time surrounded by the beauty of nature is all I could ask for in life. I set a reminder on my laptop that I had an interview and hastily jotted down the number that she said she would be calling me from. I tried so hard to focus at work that day, but it felt like I was stumbling over orders and making careless mistakes again and again. Every time I slipped up, the manager walked over and yelled at me, then muttered to herself in Spanish and walked away. I was so close to quitting on the spot, but something told me to hold off just a bit longer, until I know for sure if I got the new job yet. Fast forward to the next day, Abigail called me about five minutes late. She asked me pretty basic questions. My past work experience, my work ethic, asked me to describe some of the experience I have had in the wilderness and what knowledge I can bring to the team. I answered her questions honestly and very thoughtfully, making sure to reference real-world scenarios whenever possible so she didn't think I was bluffing with all the experience I claimed to have. It seemed to be going great, and I was certain I would the position. I was smiling wider than I had smiled in months when she asked me the question that sticks with me to this day. Are you afraid of what lurks in the shadows of the trees at night, Jake? It took me a minute to figure out how to respond to this. I didn't expect her to ask me that. When I was going over interview questions the night before, I planned just about everything out, even some follow-up questions to ask her about the position that would show how interested I am. I had not prepared for this. I'd never been afraid of the woods or any nature at all. I had no reason to be. I knew everything there was to know about defending myself. I could use a knife pretty well, was a great aim with a crossbow, and had even made my own bows before out of materials in the woods. I didn't exactly believe in supernatural beings or demonic entities, so there was no reason to be afraid. Still, her question unsettled me a little bit. I tried to convince myself that it was just a joke and she wasn't serious. But the lack of laughter matching my nervous laughter shot that theory down pretty quickly. I took a deep breath and responded, I've never been afraid of the shadows and the trees. I do just fine in the wilderness and have never been in a situation where I feel like I lost control. Her response sent chills up my spine. I reckon you should be, honey. She's always watching, even if it feels like she left. No matter how far you go, she'll always be a few steps behind you. 
She's always smiling, too, if you dare ignore. Abigail cut off as she began talking to someone else on her end of the line, assumingly a co-worker or another park ranger. She eventually put herself on mute, and I spent a few moments processing what had happened. Who is, uh, what happens if you ignore her? I felt a bit uneasy, but then realized that Abigail works with the parks. I feel like to work with an Ann P is, you have to be at least a bit crazy. Not many people would want to give up the luxuries of fast internet, guaranteed electricity, and a healthy social life to live alone in the middle of the woods, patrolling and yelling at people who started fires outside of fire pits. Even if you weren't crazy getting in, Chances are, by the time you retire, you'll have a therapist on speed dial. I tried to chalk it up to being that, an older lady who was starting to lose her mind, and brushed it off as no big deal. Just as I came to my conclusion, I heard Abigail's voice on the other end of the line again. Congratulations, Jake. You're perfect for the position. We're going to send you a ticket for your plane that'll be embarking to Alaska to start in Denali National Park in three days. Do you have any more questions? I froze for a minute. I was going to Alaska in three days. This moment was honestly the happiest of my life thus far. The realization that everything I had dreamed of was starting to fall into place. I was likely going to be surrounded by millions of trees, millions of acres of land, and one of the most beautiful landscapes the world has to offer. It had been my dream to visit Alaska one day. And now I got to live there and get paid to do so. But I had to find out more. I wanted to know what she meant earlier about the girl who watches you. Even though I'm almost positive it was nothing, I wanted to hear it from her, just to ease my racing mind. I decided to start with a pretty general question. What should I bring with me? I asked. She responded quickly, Just your clothing and anything you might want in your station. Phone, laptop, and charger, winter clothing, a few decorations or memories from home, any other weird gadgets you love, and maybe a pocket knife. We'll provide everything else you need. I didn't exactly have a lot to my name, aside from my car and a few boxes of crap that I'd collected over the years, so I figured I'd pack light. I had to do a bit of shopping for winter clothing, as it's never cold enough to warrant heavy jackets in Southern California, but that would be a lot easier when I had the couple hundred dollars my car was worth in pocket. I felt like we were comfortable enough with each other, so I asked the question. You said something earlier about a woman who watches you? I asked hesitantly, half expecting her to hang up on me and deny me the job right then and there. But she chuckled and responded, Oh, sorry about that. Sometimes my brain acts all wonky with these interviews. She cleared her throat and continued. It was just one of those moments. Nothing to be afraid about. That explanation resonated with me, and I thanked her for her time and hung up. I could hardly sleep at night, anticipation for my flight and vivid dreams about the forests, the wildlife and life as a ranger filed my thoughts constantly. One night it got so hard I had to take Benadryl just to make myself drowsy enough to get a few hours of shut-eye. It was the day of the flight. Dallin helped me with my bags and drove me to the airport. I decided I would give him the rest of the money I had as I was sure there wouldn't be any convenience stores where I was heading, and left him everything I couldn't take with me. I don't know if he was just taking it, so I didn't have to lug it down to Goodwill or deal with a horror commonly known as Facebook Marketplace, but I appreciated it either way. I entered the terminal, scanned my boarding pass, and checked my duffel bags and carried a pack with me that had all my technology. Crappy point and shoot camera I'd saved for years. My laptop cell phone with contacts of the few people I wanted to remain close with. And a few notebooks because I loved writing. Of course, I had all my hiking gear packed. Even though they said they'd provide me with gear of my own when I got there, it was too difficult to part with the shoes and poles and things that had kept me going for so many years when I had nothing else to look forward to. I boarded my plane, threw my backpack in the overhead stowaway bin, and prepared for takeoff. 
This was it, the moment that my entire life's hoping and working had culminated into. Every struggle I had, every moment of doubt, whether I wanted to keep pushing on through the poverty and pain was gone. My dreams were about to become a reality. I braced myself for takeoff and shut my eyes to get a little bit of rest while the plane began its six-hour journey towards Alaska. The plane touched down at Anchorage International, and it would be a short drive to get to the park where I would be stationed. I was greeted by a friendly face who I assumed to be Abigail. She was a frail woman, most likely in her late fifties, but had this fire in her eyes. She didn't look tough, but I had to assume she was a lot stronger than her appearance put on. Behind her was a man, about my height and a little more muscular. I assumed he would be training me or working with me at my post. Neither of them said much other than exchanging basic pleasantries, and I was instructed to follow her to the van that they had arranged for transportation. The minute I stepped foot out of the airport, I was in shock. Alaska was absolutely beautiful. I'd seen pictures of it before, watched a few shows on television when I used to have cable, and of course seen plenty of YouTube videos that people put out there, but it's just so much more incredible in person. The trees in the distance, the chilly air that just felt so much fresher than the city air, the dynamic of people in the area all felt so surreal. It truly felt like home. Home something I really needed at that point in my life. We got in the van, a small white transit that definitely showed some signs of use and headed north towards Denali National Park. I sat next to the muscular man whose name I learned to be Zeke. Abigail had left a bit earlier. I guess it was just me and Zeke right now and the person driving the van who had a weird love for classical music. I put one of my earbuds in knowing that I probably wouldn't get a lot of time to listen to music during orientation, and enjoyed the drive as the sun started to sleepily duck down under the huge snow-capped mountains to my right. Eventually, we got to the ranger station. It was a small building, but from the outside, it looked very inviting. The walls were made of wood, and the lights had a yellowish glow to them. There were windows on all sides, and a little check-in desk for those who were driving through. Surrounding the ranger station were towering green trees, which I recognized to be primarily white spruce. And to the left, a bit there was a building that looked like some form of bathroom connected to a garage. I'd gotten to know Zeke a bit on the ride up. He was pretty quiet, but we had a lot of similarities. He was only a few years older than I was, and had also been kicked out of his house by his family, although he wouldn't tell me why. Zeke grew up in Montana, in a small town near Glacier National Park, and fell in love with the surroundings. He told me he'd been working for the National Parks for a year now, and was bumped up to one of the lead positions at Denali. I really felt like I could get along with Zeke, although there was something a bit off about him. It felt like he was hiding something. It had to have been the voice. It sounded as if there was some underlying fear or anxiety in his tone. Oh well, he seemed to be a really good person, and I'd be working with him indefinitely, so there was an obligation to get along to some extent. If something happened to one of us, we had to be able to depend on the other for help. I wasn't used to this, and I knew it wouldn't come as easy as the textbooks make it feel but it was something I could work towards. As the van pulled up to the garage next to the facilities, I motioned to get out, but Zeke reached over me and pulled the door shut once more. You're not stopping here, he said with a grin. You'll be stationed in a tower about five miles north in the forests. Everything you need should be there. A hunting rifle, clothing, gear, your phone, and the numbers that you may need to call, and a handbook with all the information that you'll need for now. He paused for a moment, then continued, I know it sounds silly, but make sure to read every page in the handbook. It's not that long, and the last guy who didn't. I could see a look of regret on Zeke's face as he realized that he had shared too much. Well, he had to replace somehow, and that's why you're here. It must have been evident that I had a look of shock on my face. I wish I had known this before I signed up for the position, but I guess it made sense. 
You're working in a remote area in the wilderness. All kinds of wildlife could cut your life short. If you don't know everything there is to know about the area, you could be caught with your pants down with a hungry bear looking right up at you, so to speak. I smiled and said, I'll read it all. Don't worry. The expression on his face appeared genuine, and Zeke waved as he jumped out of the van and headed towards the ranger station. I adjusted around the bed and put my feet up against the vacant left side of the van. The driver didn't say a thing and kept on driving. As the forest got denser and denser, the road felt bumpier and bumpier. Even though it didn't exactly feel like a God-sent cab ride, I felt like I was in heaven, surrounded by trees, people who also love nature. And I was making more money doing this than I would made in three years at McDonald's. Maybe this is the closest to heaven I'll ever be. Just as I was starting to drift into sleep, I saw a huge tower in the distance. It was probably 85 feet tall and had a metal staircase that wrapped around the tower frame and led into a cabin, supposedly where I was to sleep and watch from. The driver pulled off a bit, got out of the car, and opened my door. I jumped out as well and gave my legs a moment to adjust, to standing up again after hours of riding in a bumpy van. Here you are, lad. You got about a quarter mile walk to the tower through the forest to the right. He motioned his arm towards a huge expanse of trees that was surrounding the tower. It appeared as if some of the trees were taller than the tower itself. It was absolutely beautiful. I thanked him, shook his hand, put my gloves on, and began the hike towards my new home. The tower itself was amazing. It looked relatively new. The only evidence that anyone had lived in it before were the footprints gathered around the base of the steps. As I ascended the metal staircase that lead into the sky, I couldn't help but gawk at the beautiful expanse of forest that surrounded me. For miles and miles, all I could see were towering trees, mountains, and there was a small lake a bit to the west. Considering the only light that was guiding me at this point was that from the full moon and the stars that shone in the sky, it was amazing how well I could see. It was such a contrast from the mundane city views that I had grown to abhor and beat any hike or backpacking trip I had ever done by a long shot. A bright orange light helped me find the door. There were windows on three of the four sides of the tower, the fourth being the wall my bed was up against. When I entered the small cabin, there was a gunmetal filing cabinet and a wooden desk right next to the bed, and a locker which I presumed to hold all of my new belongings and the rifle. Around the unit were posters from various parks in Alaska a few pictures of the staff team, and little notes about things you can see from each window. On the wooden desk was a handbook, assumingly the one I was informed about earlier. There was a black phone connected to a landline, and a little memo pad that was turned upside down. I spent a few hours reading the handbook, nothing out of the ordinary. It outlined what I was supposed to be doing some of the standard operating procedures for common events, and gave me a breakdown of the wildlife and the plants that I would likely encounter. There was a map on one of the last pages that showed my tower in relation to the other towers throughout the park and the headquarters Zeke got dropped off at. For the most part, I was just firewatch and patrolling for now. Every two days, I would hike a trail nearby my station and make sure that no fallen logs or huge grizzly corpses stopped trekkers and trucks from exploring the park. There was a page that detailed some of the things more experienced rangers got to do. Experiments with local research teams, assessing weather conditions, tagging and tracking animals through the forests, and cutting unhealthy trees into firewood to be used at the ranger station and sold in the nearest town to benefit the forest. I assumed that there would be tours as well, but no mention of those was in the handbook. I was about to turn away when I remembered that there was a little memo pad right next to me. It looked pretty worn down. The cover was entirely faded when I turned it over, except for big words on the front that read five most important things. I assumed that it was general notes on things that were happening nearby in real time. 
The handbook was likely a bit outdated, and the notebook allowed rangers to write down what was happening and leave reminders on current events that any new hires would need to know. But when I flipped to the first page, I felt a cold shiver run down my spine through my body. In chicken scratch handwriting, it read, 1. You work alone. I glanced around the room and didn't see anyone else with me. I figured that I would be working alone when I got to the park and Zeke got out, but it felt so dark. The writing felt like it was written as a warning of sorts in case somebody else tried to pretend they worked there. Is it possible that some of the local backpackers tried to pretend to work with the parks in order to steal, or worse? I flipped the page and once again that shiver ran down my spine as I read the handwritten words. Two. She will not help you. I flipped the page again, anxiously glancing around the room, trying to figure out who she was. Three, if you hear her crying, run. I practically ripped a page off of the memo pad as I flipped again to see what was on the following page. Four, if you see her, it's too late. I slammed the book against the counter and started pacing around the room. I knew that I was getting myself into a job that could be dangerous, but who was she? What kind of tasks was I really doing here, aside from watching for fires and hiking trails? I really wanted to know more and soon, but I was starting to get tired and wouldn't be able to get very far with the intense jet lag and the lack of sleep recently. I took off my shirt and boots and set my backpack down next to the cot I'd be sleeping in. It was actually quite comfortable, at least more comfortable than sleeping on a couch had been. I decided to sleep with a utility belt on, knife, flashlight, and a Fen 5, 7 pistol that I had found in the locker, just in case. All of this would blow over in the morning, when I got answers, I'm sure. At least that's what I told myself as I tossed and turned in bed for 20 minutes trying to calm my nerves. I awoke to the sound of rain pattering against the roof of the tower. Great, I thought. I won't be able to hike down to the station in this weather. I got up, cleared my eyes, and blew my nose, and looked out the window. There was a heavy fog surrounding the tower, and I could barely see the trees closest to me, let alone the lake or the ranger station. I decided to look through the handbook one last time and see if I could find any phone numbers to the ranger station. When I looked through the night before, I found no mention of the phone at all, and no idea how to reach others in case of emergencies. I guess it's very possible that I was too groggy and missed a key detail. I started walking towards the wooden desk when I froze. Someone was coming up my tower. I instinctively put my hand on my hip where my 5-7 was stored and was ready to pull it out and fire. Just as I started to raise the gun, I saw a young woman's face in the window. She was wearing typical ranger attire, a heavy snow jacket, cargo pants, heavy boots. She had a utility belt on as well, with a knife and a gun similar to mine on her waist. I, laughing at my stupidity for almost killing a fellow ranger, put the gun back in its holster and opened the door. Hi, I'm Autumn. I just wanted to say hi to the new guy. She blushed and pointed out through my window towards where the entrance to the park would be. Most of the times you can find me at the main headquarters. Sometimes I like to work with the new recruits until they're comfortable with their duties. If you want, I can take you on a little tour when the weather clears up a bit. She was soaking wet. Her hair looked fresh out of the shower. She had to have trekked at least five miles to get here. Through heavy rain and terrible conditions, there was no way I would say no to letting her stay a bit. Plus, it was starting to get colder. If she got caught out while it was snowing with soaked clothing, chances are it wouldn't end well. You can stay here for a bit if you'd like. I just woke up a few minutes ago. I was looking for a manual on how to use the phone because I had a couple questions. I can't find any phone numbers or any information about how to contact the headquarters. I said pointing towards the phone. She chuckled and replied, Oh, those phones don't work. They're really just an aesthetic at this point. The lines used to be up and running, but now they're good as dead. You'd have to walk down to the headquarters to ask, but since I'm here, you may as well ask me. I felt embarrassed to ask about the notes in the notepad, so I quickly put together a random thought. 
What do we do about getting food here? Do they do supply runs? To resupply the towers, or do you have to walk to pick up your own? I mean, it wasn't a bad question at all. Besides, I was getting hungry and couldn't find any food around the room. They'll bring it by in a few hours, he said, smiling. It's not exactly what I'd call comfort food, but it fills the stomach and gives you the energy you need to keep trekking. I smiled, thinking back to all the times that I'd gone hungry because I couldn't afford to eat. I wasn't eager to tell Autumn my entire life story, so I stayed silent, but the prospect of getting food handed to me and decent, livable food made me livid with excitement. By the way, EHQ told me to tell you that there was an incident on one of the trails not too far from here. Since it's in your territory, they want you to check it out. Something about a boulder that's obstructing the path. I guess it became dislodged with the rain and rolled down the hill. I didn't realize how long it had been raining. I guess it had to have started while I was sleeping, since there was a steady pour by the time I woke. I'll check it out when... The weather clears up. Do you know where it is? It's west of here. If you look on the map in your handbook, you'll see a trail called Boulder Ridge Loop. It's a seven-mile loop trail that goes around a mountain. I laughed. Ironic. Huh. The boulder destroyed the Boulder Ridge Loop. Do you know exactly how much more rain we're going to get tonight? She shook her head. Not sure, to be honest. Chances are it'll get light for a few hours, then start raining pretty heavily again. If I were you, when it starts to ease, I would head out as fast as you can and try to assess what happened. She paused for a moment, then continued. I'd be more than happy to tag along if you'd like the company. To help, plus it might be difficult to determine the trailheads on your first full day. That sounds great. I'm going to get changed and start getting ready so we can leave in an instant. She started walking towards the door and said, I'll wait near the trailhead. Don't dilly-dally too long, buddy. She gave me a friendly wave and jogged down the metal steps. Autumn seemed like a nice person. She was pretty attractive, friendly, and seemed knowledgeable. I put on a heavy rain jacket that was in my locker when I realized something. I sprinted over to the desk and grabbed the memo pad. Turning back to page one, I traced the scratched letters with my fingertip. One, you work alone. I flipped the page again. Two, she will not help you. I started to panic. I couldn't go out with her. I'd already broken two of the rules that were in the memo pad. There was no way for me to reach the ranger station to ask them for clarification. I tried to be rational. Maybe she doesn't work with me and she's just telling me my duties. I thought trying to alleviate the anxiety from my mind, but it didn't help at all. I spent about an hour pacing back and forth, back and forth, until I noticed that the rain had started to lighten up. I began to pace faster, and faster, looking through drawer upon drawer, trying to find something that could help me, maybe a mobile phone or a map so I could find the trail myself, or keys to some truck that was out of plain sight nearby. I couldn't find anything. Hours and hours passed until I noticed that the sky was getting darker and darker. God damn it, I thought to myself. I didn't get a chance to do anything today except worry. I turned the light on with a switch in the cabin and went back over to look through the handbook, once again hoping that I missed something that would help me in this situation, but I found nothing new. I looked outside and could see nothing once again. There was a heavy fog all around the tower, and it was pitch black out. It must have been at least 10 p.m. I was considering calling it a night and trying to get some sleep when I heard a faint voice call out from the bottom of the tower. Hey, are you coming? Oh, God, she's back, I thought to myself. I had the pistol on my waist, but grabbed a hunting rifle. Something was very off about this place, about autumn. At first I thought I could trust her, but at this point I didn't know if I could trust anybody. I started to crawl slowly towards the door. I put my back against the thin frame of metal that separated the door and the wide glass window and peered out. I saw Autumn standing at the base of the tower, staring up at me. Her eyes were wide as saucers, and she was smiling. Not your typical smile. This smile was dark, twisted, scary.
It didn't quiver one bit, and she didn't lose her gaze once, even when I looked away. Hello, I heard her call out. I peeked again, and she was now looking to the left, no longer right at me. I reached for the door and slowly creaked it open when I heard it. I heard her begin wailing. Not your typical. I stubbed my toe on a coffee table wail. Her screams were piercing. It was impossible to think straight. Even the constant pour of rain couldn't drown out her wailing. I remembered the third number in the memo pad and began to shake. Three, if you hear her crying, run. I swung open the door and started to run down when her gaze immediately locked onto me. Her eyes had turned pure white, and she immediately stopped wailing and smiled once more. Saliva dripped down from her teeth, and she began to laugh as she locked her eyes with mine. And if that wasn't bad enough, blood began to pour out of her eyes. I'm not talking a little bit. It, it was running down her face and collecting in the collar of her ranger jacket. Her once beautiful hair was beginning to fall out by the second, and she began to tremble uncontrollably, as if she was about to explode. Four. If she sees you, it's too late. In a split second, I drew my hunting rifle. She began to sprint the stairs faster than any animal I had ever encountered. Her steps were effortless and didn't stumble one bit. I immediately aimed at her and fired. A bullet hit her right in the chest, and I saw her smiling corpse fall through the cracks between the metal steps. A pool of blood erupted from her body, and she lay motionless. I sprinted back into the tower, leaving my rifle on the deck, and slammed the door shut. With all the strength I had left, I pushed the filing cabin against the metal cabin door and immediately collapsed against the cold metal as I listened to the rain drum against the roof of my tower. I was in shock, drained, exhausted, confused, and afraid. I don't know what that thing was, but it would bother me no more. I felt a wave of relief rush over me. All I had to do was make it to morning. I could get to the ranger headquarters and get the F out of this place, out of this cursed forest, out of this shitty metal tower, away from this demonic creature that called itself Autumn. That brings us to the present moment. I'm sitting here, phone in my hand, writing this up on my notepad app, or however, I just need to check something. I remember the title of the memo pad said that there weren't four things, but five I glanced over at the title of the memo pad. As I expected, it read five most important things. I thumbed through the pages. One, you work alone. Two, she will not help you. Three, if you hear her crying, run. Four, if she sees you, it's too late. I paused for a moment, then turned the page once more. Simultaneously, as I turned the page, I heard that familiar pounding of feet sprinting up the stairs. Heavy, heavy feet, and the sobbing was back somehow twice as loud as it was before. I looked at the words on page five and dropped the memo pad to the floor in fear. Five, do not try to kill her under any condition. She does not die. It was the summer of 2015, and I was in 12th grade. Me and two other friends went on the camping trip in Alberta, Canada. The drive up was normal. We got to the campsite, and oh yeah, one of my friends, who we will call Jeff, brought his girlfriend, who we will call Jane. Some when we pulled up to our camp spot, we unloaded our gear, then had lunch, and then we went on for a hike. Around three o'clock, we came back around five. Fifteen, and for about four hours, we sat around the campfire telling stupid stories and other stuff like that. But this is when shit gets too real. We started to get the feeling we were being watched, which is weird because there was no one around us for about a whole kilometer. So we thought it just might be a fellow camper. So I yelled out, hey, but no response. So we just ignored it. Later that night, I to the sound of snapping twigs. I looked out of the tent curiously, and what I saw was a creature about 20 meters away from the tent. It was about eight feet tall with nut brown hair, and that's all I could really see in the moonlight. So I woke up my friend, and he went pale. He slowly closed the tent zipper and looked at me and said, It's right outside. I told them that's impossible because it was just 20 meters away.
To start out, my name is Doe, and my father and I are what you would call avid hunters, and we know what is in the woods where we hunt. Well, we took a trip to West Virginia to go black bear hunting. I was back at the camper resting from the early morning bear hunt, and my father went out to go hunting for the afternoon. I knew where he would be in case of an emergency. Well, he gets to his spot and stays there till the sun sets, and then he starts to head back to the side. By side, he took out to get to his spot. On his way back, he heard footsteps, and remember, this is in the mountains where only hunters and rare locals know where they're at. The footsteps he heard were nothing human or bare. He stopped for a second and kept walking, and then the most blood-curdling yet powerful yell came from behind him. He thought, so this is how it ends. Well, it will be a hell of a race if he gets to the side by side. As soon as he got in, something came running up at him and threw a giant rock at him. My father came back to the camper. I was waiting for him, and that was the first time I ever saw my father scared. He didn't come out of the camper until it was time to leave, and we left with no further incident whenever we returned. My brother and I had an encounter while driving that I will never forget. Not a week goes by that I do not think about the encounter, what it was or the significance. I have subsequently searched for local or regional reports of similar experiences or sightings matching our confrontation and came across your website. At the time of the event, I lived with my brother and we liked to go food shopping at night to avoid the crowds. It was a cloudless and brightly moonlit fall, night in October 2011, and we liked to drive around with the windows and sunroof open with the heat blasting while breathing in the crisp, cool Pennsylvania fall air. We had a vehicle full of groceries while taking a long way home. I'd turned off Route 329 in North Whitehall Township, Lehigh County, onto Cobbler Road, a road I do not recall ever driving down before. I had heard the sound of wings flapping through the sunroof and above the car, and immediately figured it was an owl, egret, or blue heron, but instead I saw something much larger, as it flew parallel to the car, and then looked out and up the front windshield and looked it in its dead black eyes. It was a man with dangling human legs, torso and arms, and a huge bat-style wingspan, the width of the roadway. I can only describe the appearance as gray-like in a dead, lifeless face with no expression. It didn't look real. The hair on my back and arms were standing on end, and I kept thinking to myself that this is something I am not supposed to see, and this can't be real. As we continued along the road, our interaction with the being was only a few seconds before it veered to the left and ascended the hill. As we continued along Cobbler Road until we came to the intersection of Cobbler and Bellevue, and I stopped the car and watched it continue to flap its wings as it continued on its path. I remember repeating to my brother, What is that? What is that? repeatedly as the wing flapping looked unnatural and almost robotic. My brother said, follow it, but I refused as every instinct I had told me to flee, and this was something I was not supposed to see. I briskly made a ride on Bellevue and headed home. The whole interaction lasted 30 seconds tops. At the time, I had a poor quality Blackberry camera and didn't even think to try and take a photo or video. The moment was terrifying, and my flight response overcame any other scent. After researching the area, I found that the building we had just passed as our interaction began was an old abandoned slaughterhouse. I do not know if that had any significance, nor was I unaware it even existed. I have a few links to that particular facility. I have a master's degree in engineering, so naturally I search for a prosaic answer based on logic and reason, hence why my brain initially went to a large bird like an owl, egret, or blue heron, but it wasn't. We know what we saw, and it was a winged man just a few feet away. I was camping in upstate New York many years ago. 
I was having trouble sleeping in the tent, so I got up and got in the car. After some time passed, I had a very strange feeling I was being watched. The hairs on my neck were standing up. I slowly look up and out of the passenger window, maybe 30 feet away. I see a tall humanoid figure, unnaturally tall. Long arms, long skinny fingers, pale skin, and a stretched out ghoulish looking face. Although it wasn't looking at me directly, I had the distinct feeling that it was aware of my presence and stalking me. I was pretty much frozen in fear. I didn't want to make any sudden movements but I was able to slowly duck into the floorboard and hide until morning. I was a sailor in the United States Navy for four years. During my time out at sea, I had seen some interesting things. First, I was an aviation ordnanceman on a gun mount in the Arabian Gulf. There were two instances of two separate things that had happened. First off, which at the end doesn't end up too creepy, but I thought I'd share it anyways. While on gun mount watch from balls to four, we were watching into the sea to see several streaks of water coming towards the ship. Like these streaks reminded me of when you see torpedoes in the movies and the streaks in the water that they leave behind. Seen these through night vision goggles. Turns out they were whales. The second is pretty busy. So when on your balls to four watch, you have to even look in the air for possible air assaults. As we are looking at the sky, there seems to be a satellite or something similar, looking like it was orbiting the Earth. The fantail gun mount says Mount 50. When do you see that object in the sky? Looks like it's right above us. I've seen it and confirmed to the other mount that I had seen it. They told us to watch that object. About three minutes of watching this object, it speeds up and heads towards the bow of the ship, immediately changes direction and shoots towards the fan tail and disappears. Within ten seconds, all the gun mounts were calling into the bridge about this object, freaked us out. This was maybe August of 2011. Hey, everyone! Gonna start by saying I generally don't believe in the paranormal or ghosts, etc. But I have been working in this school for just over a year now, and my perspective is beginning to get changed. I don't know if this is the right place to tell this in. If it is not, please guide me to the correct one. I think I'll start by just explaining the school. It's based in London and is a very old school that has been here for almost 100 years. The school is massive, three floors and loads of classes or rooms, etc. So my first experience started with something completely small or insignificant, but made me think more. I am a PE teacher in the school, and I was in the school for a holiday club. This means there was nobody in the school other than me and my team and the children we were working with. The children are not allowed upstairs or anywhere without us. What happened was I was outside coaching, and I looked up to the third floor, and there was papers in the room fluttering in front of the windows. Now, this could obviously be explained by a draft or open window, of course. The strange thing is that at this point we had no access to the school top floors, and they are locked and alarmed. The alarm will go off if any windows and doors are open. The main thing that happened to make me think happened two days ago. I was walking upstairs to my office in the second floor. We now have access to all floors. And I heard a person whistling, like full-on whistling. This whistling stopped as soon as I came off the stairs, and just a reminder, there is nobody in the school. Apart from my team, and definitely nobody on the second floor. The next thing is that I left my office and walked to the second floor staff room, which is directly across from my office, and on that walk I heard a child laugh and giggle. There is absolutely no way any children were on the second floor, and no way I heard it was from downstairs. There has been other strange occurrences, but this is the first time I've really been unable to debunk it.
My dad was on an aircraft carrier during Vietnam, and he and his buddies used to go sit against the wheels of the aircraft on deck and waste time at night. He reports there was a really bright light far off in the distance. He thought was a star or planet. But all of a sudden, it moved really quickly and hovered off the side of the ship next to them for a few moments. Then it took off and was completely out of sight within a second. He loves to tell the story of his UFO experience. No probes here, people. Merely a very fast, bright ball of light. Get it. Now that I saw the post about ball lightning, I'm thinking that may have been it. Having my dad check out the YouTube videos to confirm. Response from my dad. Well, I watched the video, and it's possible that is what we saw. It came down like a falling star with a tail on it, and then stopped about a mile above the ocean, got larger, and went parallel with our ship for about five or six seconds. Then it got small again, like it was going straight away from us, turned right, and went out of sight in a matter of a few seconds. It was like supersonic speed. This says they are usually associated with thunderstorms. Ours was on a perfectly clear night. However, we were just off of the Philippines, and it was super hot and humid. You might have solved the mystery, though. Thanks for the enlightenment. Love you. There are a series of events in my childhood home, mostly at night. I'll name a few. Once, I was going downstairs at around 1 a.m. Everyone was asleep except me. I woke up for a drink. I went downstairs, opened the fridge, and while I was holding the fridge open, I placed my phone with a flashlight on the table. I felt something grabbing my hand like an actual touch. I looked while I pulled away, and there was nothing there. I got incredibly scared. I was sure that my brain wasn't playing tricks or anything. I was sure. So I ran upstairs and left my phone there. Another incident was when I was much younger, also around. 1 a.m., my twin sister and I were up. The door was directly facing the bed, and we were playing on her bed with the lights all out and everyone else asleep. Suddenly, the light goes on, and we see a shadow directly under the door. We thought it was our parents. Then the light goes out, and we take a slight peek with our tablets in our hands. Using the flash, there was nothing there, and we didn't hear any sound of anyone leaving or even in the house. We could also hear sounds downstairs quite a bit at night. Our parents never experienced any of this, and when we asked them about it, they never knew anything about who was downstairs. My sister could hear it, too. These are the more major incidents. We don't have any signs of them anymore, but I also had quite a few nightmares. This happened in a school forest field trip in 7th grade in Sweden. So we were playing a game called Ten, which is one dude as a warden, that everyone touches on its back every round while the warden don't look. Then the other kids hide, and the warden gets ten steps and then counts down from thirty. After multiple rounds, the warden counts from ten. Yada, yada. Yada. Here is the happening. I was just running from the warden after wrapping its back during a countdown, and it was lots of tall and big trees. And I was at a somewhat of a drop down dirt path. It was about a one meter drop, and I could not see past this drop due to the extreme greenness of the trees. But I ran down there anyways, and just as I go to look up after dropping down, I hear something behind the trees. It sounded awful and terrifying, so I looked to my left, and about three meters from me. I saw a two, three-meter tall black figure. That figure was a male moose that was dead eye staring at me. So we made eye contact, and the moose just started to look upset, if that makes sense. It was not happy about me. So I literally backed up that dirt drop as slow as I could, and then ran like a mother trucking cheetah. Scary part is that two weeks after, that exact moose chased my friend on a bike while in a suburban area where we live, and the moose was just one subway sandwich away from him, about 30 centimeters. 
so my friend was close to his doom, just biking to school. And the moose have been reported as effing aggressive in our community Facebook group, Creepy Stuff. I was swimming in a lake alone, and I felt someone watching me. I went back to the bank to get my glasses and saw some dude walking through the woods towards me. Something went off in my brain, and I just took my shit and ran. Dude also starts running, and I just sprinted headlong back down the trail, about 100 yards to a parking lot where there were other people. Turn around, heart pounding. There is no one behind me. Fight or flight switch tripped hard. I encountered a bipedal wolf-like creature here in western Michigan, and it's got me spooked. I was out shoveling snow, as it's common here in my state. My encounter happened in a place just south of Rothbury, Michigan. I decided to take a walk in my family's woods one day. That's when my life changed forever. My family owns 270 acres of land here in the town or city of Montague, Michigan. I ventured out into those woods, as I've done many times, one hundreds of them. The walk started as anyone would. I started to follow the creek south to check for deer stands on our property. The walk went as planned until I got about 300 yards south of the house. I stopped to have a cigarette. My eyes started to wander as I scoped for deer or coyote. As I gazed back and forth, I noticed this figure and froze. I literally froze. This thing made eye contact with me and then stood up. It was hairy, had very broad shoulders and amber-colored eyes. It let out a growl unlike any other I've heard. This wolf, as I call it, made two leaps and was gone. The most surprising thing about this encounter was how silent the woods were. Up to when I had my encounter. So that you know, your episode 80 is what made me want to talk about this. Hello, I live here in rural West Michigan in the town of Montague. It is located in northern Muskegon County. I've had three different encounters with a wolf-like creature. The first encounter took place on, or about February 2, 2016, 4, 38 a.m. I was shoveling the driveway as it was snowing heavily and needed it cleared for the propane delivery. There are woods all around, but this encounter took place in the woods to the south. As I was about halfway done with the shoveling when I heard a splash in the creek, I thought it was a deer I'd spooked. So I stopped and started to scan the woods and creek. Then all of a sudden this huge, and I mean huge, wolf-like creature leapt into the air and took off with a supersonic burst of speed to the west. It crossed the road and continued west. I heard branches snapping right and left. I stood there absolutely frozen in total shock and amazement at what I'd just seen. The second encounter took place on April 11, 2016, 3, 15 p.m. I was a bit shaken up by the first encounter that this was my first trip back into the woods since. I was walking the property, which consists of about 30 acres of mainly hardwood and creek bottom. I was crossing the creek headed east when I caught something out of the corner of my eye to the south. I was about 30 to 35 yards from what I thought was a black bear. It was tearing profusely at the west bank of the creek. Then it stood up and I froze. It turned around and stood up on its hind legs. This was at least seven half feet tall. I was in the middle of the creek and was absolutely shitting myself. I didn't want to run out of fear it would give chase and the firearm I had brought didn't stand a chance against this thing. Then all of a sudden it put its nose straight up into the air and sniffed a couple of times. It looked immediately to the east, looked back at me, and with two huge strides took off into the thicket headed east. After it cleared the thicket it jumped into the trees and was leaping from treetop to treetop. And this one had all black fur that was matted and smelled horrendous, like rotten guts and sour fruit. The first wolf-like creature I saw was a grayish color with a little white in it. They both had pointed ears and a snout, a number of jagged-looking teeth and tails. The second one had much longer claws than the first one did. The third and final encounter came May 2, 
2016 9, 20 p.m. I was collecting some kindling from the wood line south of the house. I had just about finished when I heard a loud snap. I stopped and listened for any movement. I'm on the wood line, not in the woods. I'm too frightened to step foot in them. Then I heard rustling sounds and another snap. This one sounded like a bone, not a branch. The sounds intensify, so I click on my flashlight. I started to scan the distance. As I get about halfway, I see glistening eyes yellow in color about 25 yards in front of me. I kept my light on it. It snarled and let out this deep growling sound that literally shook me. I started to back up, and again, this thing stood up and bent over to pick something up. I kept the light on it. It picked up what is was after, turned around and looked at me like I interrupted something it was doing, and just walked off into the woods to the south and disappeared. The next day I have my cousin walk out with me too, where the creature stood. What we found was the hide, and only the hide of a white-tailed deer. I truly believe that the creature I saw was responsible for this. It was skinned like something just gag a creature I saw. Reminds me of a werewolf. In my three encounters, the one thing that freaks me out is how eerily silent it got before my encounters. I have since found out that the property has many Indian burial grounds on it, heavily wooded with a freshwater creek running through entire property. I used to walk the woods four times a week, and since my encounter, I have a very hard time walking the wood line, let alone the woods themselves. I had an encounter with something, but I'm currently unsure as to what. I was told to contact you. Due to personal factors, I moved in with some family to a rural area of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. My aunt's house, where I'm at, sits on one of several hills with a meadow below it. She also owns several acres of woods with a creek running through them and so on. It's a very desolate place. One morning in September 2023, I woke up around 5 a.m. to some twig snapping. I went outside and walked downhill to the meadow and by some holly bushes that border the woods, I saw a large figure looking ahead. I called out at first assuming it was a person, as on occasion we will get hunters, but these are neighbors who give proper identification and basically let us know when they'll be around. Instead of responding, the figure walked away. It seemed to almost shrink into the woods. It was a large figure, easily six feet minimum. I didn't get the greatest look at it as it was dark and somewhat far away, but I saw heavy shaggy fur or hair, looked like quills. I want to say multiple layers of it, set back face, noticed large eyebrows and a nose. The head sunk into the torso. It was a mix of brown and gray fur or hair colors. I returned to the spot in a few hours and stepped over behind the bushes. All the holly berries from the plants were gone. They were there a few days prior. They were also indents in the ground, maybe footprints. They were sticks snapped off of the trees and thrown across the ground. I was certainly unsettled, so I looked into it further and thought I'd concluded that this may have been some sort of ape or apeman. Bigfoot, I'm not a hunter doing drugs, nothing like that. It was ape, like, do you have any thoughts? Living back in the middle of the woods, I've had numerous campouts basically involving typical camp out tropes, but with the accessibility of plumbing and electricity not too far away. During one of these campouts, a group of friends and I played what we called manhunt, which is basically hide and seek in the moonlit woods, while only the hunter has a flashlight. We always played these kinds of games. One time, while hiding out fairly far from the house, me and the people I was hiding with saw a flashlight and heard leaves rustling behind us. Opposite direction of the house where we knew the hunter was, and we all just booked it back towards the house, screaming. I don't think it was anyone with malicious intent, but I was really young at the time, and it scared the shit out of me, but I'd believe the poor guy was probably just as scared from a bunch of children suddenly jumping up and screaming. 
This didn't stop us from continuing to play this game, so I guess it wasn't that scary, but as a child, I remember it being a lot scarier. Clitz Camp was a fun year and activity for the students of Dow, a guy at school system. The students would get a break from traditional classes to partake in a more outdoor environment. Parents and students alike enjoyed the Fitch Camp experience as it was a fun way for the kids to participate together. Situated amongst the unique southwest Michigan geography of the Sister Lakes, the children were able to engage in a serene environment. After some outdoor races, a group of kids went to the makeshift archery range. After the exercise, the students were supposed to go directly to the diner at the mess hall. However, Two of the girls, Denise McCormack and Janine Fisher, went to retrieve an arrow which had gone astray. Approximately one half hour later, Denise and Janine showed up late to dinner and sat with their friends, Rhonda Burdick and Stacy Ashley. It was during that dinner that Denise and Janine confessed to their friends that, while looking for the arrow, they saw a huge, stinky, hairy man staring at them. They told their friends that it was really big and just stared at them. So they ran. The story quickly spread, and by the time they went to bed that night, everybody was laughing at them. That changed when the cabin in which these same girls were staying was suddenly attacked. Stacy Ashley stated that something began smashing the side of the cabin. I thought it was going to smash the wall in, she added. We were all screaming, and Janine was thrown onto a bed. The camp counselor was not present and was later thought to be the one smashing the side of the cabin, attempting to frame the girls. However, the next morning, after washing away what she thought were fake footprints from the mud leading up to the side of the cabin, Susan Howell remarked that she was shocked to notice the side of the cabin had scratches along the foundation. She immediately wished she had not washed away the footprints. She took Polaroid pictures of the cabin, but was told by another camp director that they did not prove anything. However, some 50 years later, all the girls involved in the incident still stand by the sighting and the attack. My girlfriend and I were driving down a remote country road in the early summertime, late one evening. She was the one driving. I was in the passing, gear seat. The sun was setting behind us. We had just come around a curve when two does jumped out onto the road in front of us. They acted like we weren't even there. They seemed to be focused on something else. So she jammed on the brakes and brought the car to a stop. I told her, man, that was close. That's when I looked up into the rear view mirror to see if any more deer were coming. When I did that in the red glow of the car's taillights, I saw something take a big step into the road from the brush that was on the side of the road. Whatever it was landed on its right leg when it did that. Looking at it in the rearview mirror, I could see it from its mid-thigh up to its stomach. In one motion, it then took another step forward and put what looked to be a hand down on the trunk of the car to apparently balance itself. When I saw that, I turned to look at my girlfriend. She was wide-eyed, her mouth was wide open, and she was white as a ghost. I could also see that her eyes were tearing up, so I looked back. But by that time, it had already gone across the road. In an attempt to get a better look at this thing, I opened my door and got out of the car. When I looked, I could see that it was going down the embankment that was on the side of the road. Because of the brush, I could only see it from the armpits up. It was at least seven feet tall and had very wide shoulders. Its shoulders were at least one time as wide as my show. Dares and I've got wide show. Gares for a guy. From the last bit of daylight left, I could see that it was blacker dark brown in color and head point. It ears on top of its head like a dog. Its ears weren't overly wide or fuzzy. Its head was kind of domed shaped more or less with flat sides. It acted like we weren't even there and seemed to remain focused on the deer. I was thinking, what in the world is this thing? It looked like some kind of werewolf or wolf man to me. It was way too big to be a person. Through that whole ordeal, I never did get a chance to see its face. 
In the area where we saw that thing, people have reported being paced in their vehicles, going down the road by creatures that look like what we saw. In Colorado, there is a monument, which is called Rock Park, and the whole town, Castle Rock, is named after it. It is basically a big hill with a huge boulder sitting on top. The rock itself is probably 50 feet tall at its peak, and there are signs all over telling people not to climb on it. Me, my sister, and two of my sister's friends were climbing it at about 11 at night last summer. We got to the top, and there was a guy sitting by a rock on speaker with what we thought was a friend. He also had what looked like a dog sitting on top of the rock, but as we got closer, it was actually a person slumped over the rock in their checkered belt. It made it look like it was a collar, giving us the impression of a dog. As we got closer, we realized the man was on the phone with 911, and the dispatcher was saying stuff like, what does their breathing sound like? Seeing as it was around 11 at this point, we were the only other ones up there with them. We wait around and get a good look at what happened and lend some supplies like a flashlight and some water. From what we could piece together, the girl was on a first date with this guy and tried to climb the rock. She got about her 30, five feet up when she fell and hit two or three times on the way down. Her head was caked in blood, and so was the dirt all around her. We waited for over an hour for EMS to get to her, and they had to take her down in a stretcher and to a helicopter that landed in a school field to airlift her to the hospital. Last we heard, she had many broken bones, lots of shattered ribs, and a really bad concussion, but she lived. That night really shook me for a while because I honestly thought she was going to die. A few years ago, a group of my friends were jogging alone this forest, and halfway through the trail, we came across this kid who was about 16 years old and was completely off the trail and was soaking wet in at like 11 p.m. at night. So you know we asked him if he was okay and if he was hurt, and he said that he and his friends were on a bike ride, and then they decided to smoke so shrooms. So then, when they were heading back after about one half of being high, they decided to head home, and it was getting pretty dark. So then these kids saw my group's headlights and thought that it was park security, so they just started running, and while running, they got separated. And the kid we found had given up because he fell into a river while running and almost drowned. But anyway, we got him back to the front of the park, and he said he would be fine, so we just left and continued on with our night. I'm reporting a possible dogman sighting based on the information provided by my son and his friend. This incident took place in Montgomery, Massachusetts. As a four-wheel enthusiast, my older son has become familiar with the off-roading trails and rural routes he and his friends regularly use, often venturing out at night. On this particular occasion, they were in his Ford Explorer, following a familiar route in a rural town through a remote wooded area. Since it was winter, the plows had ceased maintenance at a certain point, creating a snowbank that marked the town's abandoned maintenance of the unpaved road for the season. Further use of this road was left to those who dared to venture. As my son recounted, he navigated through the snowbank and drove along the winding mountain road. He was concentrating on his driving, keeping his focus on the road, while his close friend sat in the front passenger seat. Suddenly, his friend exclaimed, Look, what is that? My son didn't take his eyes off the road because he wanted to stay on course, but his friend pointed to where the strange figure had gone. My son quickly swung his truck around and illuminated the area with his off-road lights and headlights. His friend described the creature as running like a wolf, but not exactly a wolf. He said it was large, similar to a bear, but not a bear. The creature had long hair and was lighter in color than a brown bear, more of a grayish hue. They both sat there for a minute, staring into the darkness. 
Then suddenly something pushed the SUV from behind, causing it to slide along the muddy, snowy road for a short distance. Startled, they both whipped their heads around, only to see the blackness of the night through the rear window. My son quickly started the truck and sped away from the area, not catching another glimpse of the mysterious creature. My son insisted that it couldn't have been the same creature his friend had spotted because once he had illuminated the area with the truck's lights, they should have seen movement against the white snow. Another one of my friends insisted that this was a Bigfoot, as he had encountered one eight years ago. However, the description of the creature seems to better match that of a dogman. This experience, whatever it was, is absolutely true. This story is actually my dad's. Every other summer, he and a few of his friends go over to Maine to do some bass fishing. The encounter happened at around 2 to 3 in the morning. My dad got out of his tent because he had to take a pee. As he was relieving himself, he heard a snap about 25 feet away. He looked up and saw nothing. To make sure it wasn't a predator, he shone his flashlight in the general direction. The woods were really thick, so he didn't see much except for a pair of eyes. He couldn't really tell how high up off the ground they were. Being the person he is, he walked towards it, and as he did, whatever the thing was ran away. My dad got a better look at it. He says that it was around eight feet tall and smelled pretty bad, like trash. He told his friends the next day, but they decided to stay the rest of the week because my dad didn't feel that the Bigfoot wanted to hurt them, but was just more curious. He came home and told me, and now, a few years later, I'm sharing this with you. I really hope that one day I could see what he saw, so I can fully believe that this world is actually a strange one. I live near Warren, one of those cities where downtown is the only park with actual businesses, and the rest is a gridlock system of cheap homes. One night I was helping a friend of mine and a group of people install new chairs into our local movie theater since we all know the owner, and because of this, we were out pretty late. We got out of the chair installation activity at around 2 in the morning and drove to McDonald's where, when we walked in, we saw all the staff in back room having an actual straight-up orgy. This isn't remotely important to the story, but I thought it was pretty funny. So there you go. Obviously, we did not get our McDonald's, so we all parted ways and went driving to our respective homes. As I was driving through one of the grids of houses, I stopped at one of the stop signs and looked down the dark road to my left and then my right. Each intersection in the grid has a single yellow-orange light perched above it and below the one at the far intersection I saw a young child who I can only assume was around 13 with some other girl who looked pretty close to them holding their hand. She looked about 20. I didn't really think anything of this because although it was late, my sister and I have a close relationship and late night walks in the dark aren't really uncommon in my family. My family is directly descended from the Hungarian gypsies, so sleep is essentially optional and we're always ready for an adventure. I drove on past the sign and stopped at the next one. It was late, and I was just taking my time getting home. I checked left and then right, but lingered a bit on the right path. It was a little hard to see at first, but upon a bit of inspection, I could see what looked like the same two people, but slightly closer to me, out of the light of the street lamp. Okay, that's kind of bizarre, but it's probably just a coincidence. I know some people who like walks, and the weather is pretty clear tonight. Must just be two different groups of people enjoying the nice night. I edged forward and gently careened to the next stop sign. I was a little on edge because the odds of a coincidence like that were pretty low around where I lived, so I checked my right flank first. There they were, the same two people, just slightly closer than when I had last seen them. I'm a huge fan of horror. Horror movies, horror games, horror books, even the underappreciated genre of horror music. Because of this, I didn't even bother looking left. I just floored it. 
I sped aggressively to the next stop sign, and since it was so late and I didn't have to worry about traffic, I kept my eyes trained to my right side to see if they would move closer yet again. I pushed the car down the straight and narrow asphalt pathway at a hearty 60-something, quite a fast pace for a 25 miles per hour zone. As I approached the next intersection, I saw, sure enough, that the two had moved closer yet again. There were two more intersections in this grid before I got to a main road, so I just pushed my car for all it was worth, which isn't much considering it was a slowly dissolving Jeep Cherokee from 1995. Those final two intersections yielded similar results in the advancing girls' department, and once I reached the main road, I turned down and settled to an acceptable speed. Since that encounter, I've seen nothing of these girls, but this paired with some other shit I've been through during my life is the reason I will unequivocally advocate for the existence of ghosts in one capacity or another. I had worked for the National Motors Auto Specialties for well over 20 years before I retired in 1963. As time passed, I found myself spending more and more of my days in the woods, around my house off Griffith's Road in Casa Palos. It was no surprise to my neighbors when they spotted me walking through the woods with my green backpack on in the Newton Woods. However, what came as a shock to everyone was when I stopped the Smith family from walking toward the Dow or Gaia Creek. I insisted that they needed to call the sheriff. They did as I suggested, and soon enough, deputies arrived to investigate the reported discovery of a body. After examining the scene, they determined it was the remains of multiple deer carcasses. But I maintained that I had stumbled upon something far more extraordinary. I told the police and the gathering witnesses that I had encountered a large red-haired animal that weighed as much as a truck emerging from the pile of carrion. The creature had barked at me before entering the creek and heading west. Helen Smith, who spoke with me, believed my account, saying, You cannot fake that kind of reaction. Elmer was a tough guy, but when he came up the path, he was shaking and sweating. The deputies on the scene reportedly informed the witnesses that the deer carcasses would be removed and the woods would be open for exploration. Nevertheless, the family that had been speaking with me chose to leave. Something that happened like five years ago, but I still think about all the time. It was my first apartment, which was very sparsely furnished. I was just starting out and had hardly any possessions. My bathroom was very clean and was only a toilet, a standing sink, and a shower or tub with no decorations or any extra stuff. One day in the shower, I dropped my bar of soap, bent down to pick it up, and it was not there. I felt around the tub with me feet for it then finally turned off the water and got down on my hands and knees searching for it. After a long time, I finally gave up and figured it must be outside of the shower. It wasn't. I even had my boyfriend see if he could find it the next time he came over. He agreed it was definitely not in that bathroom. This sounds super unsensational and mundane, but think about how weird that is. We both agreed it was creepy, but accepted that it just disappeared somehow. I thought about it often and told the story to co-workers and friends who just shrugged. Anyway, about six months later, when I had started to forget about it, the bar of soap was in the shower in its little spot that I always kept it. By that time, I had stopped using bars and was using body wash instead, so the sight of this thing scared the shit out of me. Honestly, what's going on with this? So for years I have only told this story to a couple of my close family members, purely due to the out-of-this-world experience and encounter that has happened to me in my younger years. So years ago a friend of mine and me went out to a forest in England, right next to a WIWA base or atomic weapons establishment base. There is a local park with lakes and some trees around the area, very peaceful and scenic during the time. So we decided to go there to get of our trolley, and before you guys start saying, 
You was just higher off your head, hence, why you saw what you saw in my previous life before I have changed my ways. This is what I used to do on daily basis, and the tolerance was sky high, and I have never experienced anything that was even close to this encounter. So the night began with staying in a car playing loud music, later following up with going out into the forest in the night to look for an adventure as such. The moon at the time was the biggest blood moon I've ever seen in the United Kingdom. It must have been times ten bigger and brighter than I have ever seen in my life. The color of the moon was a dark orange tint. I will try and see if my friend still has a picture of this moon on his phone. So after my friend started to take pictures of the moon and I take the entire experience, I started to hear ducks down in the lake being disturbed by something, possibly a predator. Hunting them or something else, following up with water disturbance, sounds being extremely loud. Now being in the United Kingdom, there are no freshwater predators that would possibly hunt the ducks during the night, apart from foxes, who in all honesty don't like a swim. So following up on this weird sounds and disturbances, I decided to go and investigate the sounds. My friends had passed on the offer to go and investigate as the sounds their way to strange for him. I decided to go in alone into the woods and following an animal trail to the lake. While going into the woods, I must have took around 20 steps and started seeing strange lights far away. It reminded me of extremely dim lights of night vision. You can barely see them, but they seemed out of place in slight blue light, seeming quiet, far away, but yet very close. So my initial thought was that this forest is guarded by soldiers, and we are being tracked. Following up from this, I tried to get closer to the lights to confirm my theory about soldiers stalking us, as this is highly guarded facility nearby. The closer I got, the further the lights got away, without any sound being made, while the ducks at the lake were still going wild, and I now can hear the sound of the water disturbance even louder. At this point, I started to alarm myself, as what I have heard cannot be natural, and I started to doubt my intention of exploring the area, and at this time I saw something move the branches in front of me while getting closer. I tried to focus on what was moving the branches, but could not locate the source of movement. It being a person, an animal, or something else, but it started to get closer and closer when it was around 10 a.m. away from me, I have started to begin to see a shape appear from the branches. It was a humanoid figure which was completely see-through, and the body was resembling a night sky of such. So a sea through body with some distant star-like lights all around its body. This has completely threw me off balance at what I was seeing. When there was around five meters left between us, this being is moving his arm towards me, as it was to be a gesture for a handshake. At that point in time, I have completely freaked out and run for my life. Back to the tree opening where my friend was stood photographing the blood moon. After making it to him, I have described everything that I have encountered and asked him to come with me back in there to verify what I have saw. I saw some fear in my friends. I was at this time with a full denial response about going into the place. We have stayed in the forest, exploring it away from the place where we have heard all of this noises for many more hours, with a feeling that we are constantly being followed and watched. To this day, I have never returned to the area with a great passion to actually find out what the hell has happened to me that time. It was a typical day in my Alaskan research lab when the unexpected happened. I was engrossed in my work examining data on climate change's impact on local wildlife when the door swung open. Startled, I looked up to find myself face to face with a team of special forces, their uniforms marked with the unmistakable insignia of the Navy SEALs. I couldn't help but crack a skeptical smile. Can I help you gentlemen with something? I asked, thinking it was a joke or some strange government experiment. The leader of the team, a weathered and stoic figure, met my gaze dead on. Dr. Parker, have you ever heard of a creature known as the Yeti or Bigfoot? 
I burst into laughter, thinking they were playing a prank on me. Bigfoot? Seriously? Are you guys here to investigate an urban legend? But their expressions remained unyielding. Serious. We're not here to joke around, Dr. Parker. The government sent us here to find a creature, something similar to a yeti, that's been spotted roaming the Alaskan wilderness. We need your expertise. I shrugged, not taking it seriously. I've been studying Alaskan wildlife for years, and I've never seen any evidence of such a creature. It's just folklore, myths, and exaggeration. The team didn't argue further. They nodded, leaving my lab to embark on their quest. My curiosity got the best of me, and I couldn't resist trailing them from a distance as they ventured into the harsh Alaskan wilderness. It was during one frigid evening as I watched them from behind the cover of snow-laden pines that I witnessed something inexplicable. The forest grew eerily silent and a shiver ran down my spine. The seals moved with a grace that defied their bulk, and then there it was, emerging from the shadows. The creature was immense, towering at least eight feet tall. Its fur was a mottled blend of white and gray matted and thick, clearly built to withstand the brutal Alaskan winters. Its eyes were hauntingly human, filled with a mix of curiosity and fear as it confronted the intruders in its territory. The beast's face was a blend of human and ape-like features, a fusion of the known and the unknown. Muscles rippled beneath its fur as it let out a guttural roar, echoing through the forest. This was no ordinary animal. It was something inexplicable, something beyond science and understanding. The Yeti, the Bigfoot, or whatever you wanted to call it, was very real. As the special forces engaged in a tense standoff with the creature, I couldn't help but marvel at the unexplainable phenomenon that had unfolded before my eyes. Yet my awe was short-lived as I began to feel that some of the special forces had noticed my presence, my intrusion. With a heart pounding like a drum, I retreated into the safety of my lab, locked the door, and watched from the window as the confrontation outside intensified. The creature ultimately retreated into the dense wilderness, but the seals were determined to continue their hunt. I can't explain the events of that day, but I swear by the truth of what I saw. There, in the depths of the Alaskan wilderness, a cryptid, a being that defied scientific understanding, had become a reality. Whether it was a Yitai, a Bigfoot, or something else entirely, it was an experience that forever changed my perspective on the mysteries of the natural world and the secrets it still holds. I am an avid hunter. My name is Bo, and I have hunted and fished all my life. I joined the Army straight out of high school, and now I work six days a week. But enough about me. Y'all want to know what true nightmares are made out of. I have found out last October, hunting a new river. I had gotten up early that morning and cooked breakfast for my fiancé. My fiancé loves fried eggs in the morning, and I do them exactly like she likes. So we eat, and I get my camel out of the bag as well as my rifle out of the cabinet. We headed out that morning, and I took my fiancé to work. Her work was on the way to New River. When we pull in, I give her a kiss, and she tells me to bring her home something good. I told her I would, and I got back in my jacked-up Chevy 2500. The trip to the mountain was as gorgeous as always, and the Tennessee back roads are amazing and beautiful. So I got to my spot, but it was so eerily quiet that morning, around noon, I decided to go to the truck and grab a sandwich and another bottle of water. So I ate a peanut butter and syrup sandwich my fiancé made me while I was getting ready. She even had time to write me a note and basically said she loved me and was happy that we were together since it was only one month out from having our little girl and she was just an amazing old lady. After I got done, I decided to walk to the tree stand again. On my walk back in the woods, I start to have this feeling of dread that something is wrong, that something just isn't right. 
but I brush it off thinking maybe it's just nerves since this is hog country after all, and I've been chased on the road before that I'm walking on. But this just kept getting worse and worse. I started getting deeper down the ridge closer to my stand, and I hear a twig break and I stop. Now, me being an experienced hunter, I notice movement in this thicket just about 50 or so yards away. I notice this brown shape moving out towards me. So I crouch down, ready my rifle, and I train my rifle on the color. When I get to noticing that this thing is grunting, so I'm thinking, yes, a big buck. God, was I wrong. The thing slowly walked out closer and closer, and I realized that Wow, this creature is so massive, it's way bigger than a deer on all fours. So I'm thinking, okay, an elk is walking out. Cool. But I noticed its head, and the shape is all wrong. It slowly starts walking out, and all of a sudden it stops and stands up. I mean, on two legs. It's easily eight feet tall. But because I'm 6'6", six, six, the thicket is just above my head. And this thing's almost a foot to two feet above it. It starts sniffing the air, and its head snaps right to my direction. I freeze up at that moment, feeling like I'm concreted to the ground. The wolf thing that I was looking at was beginning to let out this real deep, almost demonic-like growl. It starts snarling, showing its teeth towards me. I, being army, trained, realize if it charges, I'm only getting one shot at this thing, so I'd have to make it count. All of a sudden, it begins to tear through the bushes on all fours again. I realize the movie Van Halen's werewolf is charging at me at full speed. I realized I'm in big trouble, and I hear this branch break behind me. I look over my shoulder and see that there is a second larger wolf behind me on two legs. It is easily nine feet tall, built like a bodybuilder with jet black fur. It drops to all fours and starts running full speed towards me. But this one was a lot closer. I spin around and see that this thing is too fast for me to unsafely shoot at with my rifle. I jump out of the way of this monstrous beast charging me. I end up hitting the hard rocks and slid into the red clay mud just to realize it already crossed the roadbed I'd been walking on. And the two wolves are set on a collision course. When a bigger black wolf hits a lighter brown wolf, he tackles the brown wolf to the ground as they are rolling down the hill, clawing and biting and slamming each other into the hard ground. The smaller brown wolf kicks and paws from the bottom when its back claws rip the big black wolf's stomach wide open and throws him off onto the ground. The brown wolf then turns to me. It snarls and starts charging again at full speed. I am awestruck by the power of the wolf and the sheer size of it as it's on its way towards me. But the big black wolf slams the brown one from behind, running its arm through the brown one's side, picking it up, and clamps its massive jaws on a shoulder as it throws the brown one down away from me. It lands and rolls about ten yards and jumps up, running away back through the brush. I let out the breath I didn't even realize I was holding in at that moment. I look at the now bloody and beaten, ripped, open black wolf, which is standing with blood dripping off its back claws and glistening white teeth, dripping with the blood of the brown wolf. And for some reason it registers to me that I have to show that I am no threat to the king of the mountain. I lower the rifle down away from me, and as I do this, this thing smirks at me. Let's out an ear, shattering roar that turns into a howl as it looks into my soul. I see the eyes of a beast, and I can understand that it was there to show it was the Alpha. And as long as I showed him respect, he will not be a threat. It turned to drop on all fours and ran away after the other. I instantly take off running, luckily for me, in the army had allowed for me to stay in great shape. I take off of the ridge and make it to the truck. As soon as I get to the door, I realize there's blood all over the side of my truck. I hesitate to look, but I had to know. I flip the rifle safety off, ready to blast anything that jumps up from the bed of the truck. I realize there is a big dead doe laying in the bed of my truck that has had its neck broken. I jump in, start the truck, spin it around, throwing gravel into rooster. I'm tearing ass out of the woods. 
and I fly all the way down the mountain through the back roads and don't stop until I reach in Murr. My fiancé can tell I'm shaken up, so she ends up taking me home. I tell her everything, but we decide to tell everyone that I hit the dough with my truck and I got spooked by it, because who would believe me, right? That is, until I got to hearing other people who have seen this massive animal as well. So I thought that this would be the best way for me to get this story off my chest and not get told I'm crazy or lying or making it up. I just wanted to warn every hunter and hiker around that we ain't the top of the food chain or the king of the mountain because the king of the mountain is a truly massive beast who has no predators. Thanks again for helping me get this story off my chest. Now let me tell you about my second encounter. I had the Bigfoot encounter where me and my fiancé had seen that same wolfman. We have been going hunting in New River again. We have seen a family of Bigfoot for three or four years now. They have never been aggressive or anything like that. They show respect and are generally curious creatures. There are four Bigfoot in the area. The big male is jet black and about nine to ten foot tall. He looks like a jacket hair man. The second largest is a female, about eight foot tall, a light brown color with black stripes down her shoulders and back. The two smaller ones are between six and eight foot tall, both lighter brown. There is one male and one female juvenile. The young male is a dark brown with a light brown patch on his chest. The young female is a light golden brown and absolutely gorgeous in color. We usually see them all together as a family unit or the two males going out together. It looks as if they have both been on the deer trails or the gravel and dirt roads too across the area. They are all very curious. They have been known to walk up close, within 50 yards or so, whooping and chirping. Me and my fiancé, we have had a blast seeing them and getting them used to us being in the area. We have built a cabin down in the holler of the ridge. This cabin in the woods is set next to a gorgeous place set between Creek's branches, but in a way that we can get a vehicle to the door. We started first seeing the mail, and that was nervous because it isn't too far from where I had seen the two dog men fighting originally. Shortly after, we got to seeing the full family. They'd check out the truck or look in the windows at night to see if we were cooking there. For a while, my fiancé was scared of them, and then she realized that they were just curious. It has been amazing to see the young ones playing around in the creek on hot summer days. The big male lying in the cool mud with the big female laid up in the shade, while the two youngsters play, splashing and rolling in mud, and even throwing mud. Once the young male ran up behind me while I was fixing a tree stand that was sitting in the bed of my Chevy 2500, he scared me with the loud steps running up behind me, then he let out a rather strange whoop, almost as if he said, Boo, as he said. Who? I jumped around, startled, and the young one was standing there laughing like a little fat feller who would be holding his stomach, kind of like a backwoods Satan-style laugh. I laughed at him and said, You little ex. The big male walked up and grunted towards him. He waved and ran away. My fiancé had stepped out on the porch when she had heard the sound and waited to see them some more, since it's been the second time that morning that they'd been around. She'd seen me and the big male standing only ten yards away from each other. He dwarfed me. I've seen her face, and it showed she was nervous, if not scared. It was a bit shocking to see him so up close. That happened close enough to smell his musky aroma. Last weekend, I noticed he got a new open wound on his chest. It was four big claws down his burly, leathery chest. We left some fruit that was going bad out for him so he could get to it a bit easier, so he'd heal up because it showed me that he would protect the area. This weekend, we went up again but didn't hear them or see them anywhere. I was honestly kind of worried that something happened to him and that the family would be in trouble, so I kept looking for them. That Friday night, not seeing them all night long, the next morning my fiancé and I got up and had breakfast. We went hunting up the ridge just a ways and had a wonderful day together. We always have been side by side. 
Her love of hunting just made her so much more attractive to me. I honestly am the luckiest man in the world to have her as my partner. Saturday evening, we got back down to the camp, and we noticed something had been through the leaves all around the camp. It gave us a bit of hope that they're all okay. We had then gotten ready for supper, started cooking as the sun was setting. In New River, it gets pitch. Black dark in just a few moments. My fiancé had stepped out to the porch to go grab me a bottle of Jack out of the truck, and I heard the door open on the truck. I heard it slam as she came running through the door. And I dropped everything, and I hurried to make sure that she's okay. And she was standing there saying that she thought our big male neighbor was coming up the creek bed towards us. So we decided to turn the camp stove down so we could step outside to watch him approach. So as we are standing there, I light a cigarette and hand it to my fiancé as I light my own. I realized he is walking kind of weird and not sounding good. His normal strong, crisp-sounding grunts are sounding more deep and raspier. I take the bag of fruit out of the back truck and we walk down closer to the creek bed. We creep back up the creek bank towards camp. As we are, the critter is coming closer to me. Not knowing, I stepped into a hole where one of the young ones had grabbed a clump of mud and thrown it. I hit the ground hard as I was stepping backward, and I stood back up quickly, trying not to spook the Bigfoot with my pain groan. My fiancé turned and helped me back to my feet, but as she turned her back from the animal, my heart sank as I saw the deep pitch. Black Wolfman that had won the fight before with the brown wolf. He starts picking up a pace towards us, and in that moment, I jumped to my feet. I told my fiancé to run, that I'd hold it off as long as I could. Its massive body jumps through the creek, still at an incredible speed. So I put myself between the beast and I and my old lady, the love of my life. I couldn't let anything happen to her. So I'm putting myself in front, yelling this primal roar I never knew I had from the deepest place of my soul. The wolfman breaking out of the water on a full sprint towards me as I have gotten his attention. Now, I draw a bowie knife out of this sheath my grandfather had left over from the Vietnam War. At this moment, knowing I'm going to die as he would destroy me, all of a sudden, there is a roar from the top of the hill. Standing proud, the young female was roaring and beating her chest as the wolfman stops. So do I to see the new creature trying to enter the fray. My fiancé stops on a dime, and she was staring at me with tears in her eyes. As I realize that she has the hunting rifle from the bed of the truck, the wolf starts to snarl and growl. He realizes he's in trouble, and he bats me away onto my back. My fiancé takes a shot and shoots him. The shot goes into the chest, but it barely grazes him. As my fiancé comes running up to me and having another gun with her, Handing it to me, we realized that the young female and young male standing across the creek had started throwing rocks at the wolfman. I start backing up slowly towards my fiancé as the big male Bigfoot and the alpha wolfman hit into this devastating brawl, the wolf clawing and slashing, the big male proudly standing there. He grabbed the wolf by the throat and held him back as the two youngsters are pelting the wolfman with rocks, the male swinging its massive large arms down on the wolf and dropping it to its knees. But as that's going on, the wolf slashes the Bigfoot's legs, dropping him to his knees, the Bigfoot and wolfman both being dropped to their knees, and as the Bigfoot hits its knees, it lets out a pained bellow. The wolfman jumps on top of him. Then one of the other Bigfoot swings a downed tree and smashes the wolfman right in the head as it flips backwards. She swings, breaking the log across its stomach. He jumps and runs away, the female making a delicate chirping and clicking as she kneels down to the male, the young ones across the creek to reunite with the two larger family members. My fiancé is running to my side, wrapping me in a hug and holding me, saying that she's so proud of me and is just thankful that I'm okay. And we get to tearing down the mountain, every bump reminding me of my bruised ribs. I thank her for coming back for me and we get to the main road. She leans over, gives me a kiss, and we get the hell out of Dodge.
Ten years ago, on my parents' property near Colton, Oregon, when I came home after school on a Friday, I changed clothes, putting on my logger gear, and went to work in the woods about 3.30 p.m. I had my workload cut out. It was to fall timber until dark. I was finishing up on this old skid trail, falling snags when my saw ran out of gas. I refueled and sharpened the chain when I heard light thumping noises coming my way. I watched, thinking my brothers were coming, when all of a sudden, alone, duh, Dare ran past me. She just missed hitting me, and I thought that was strange. I looked back, could not see the doe at all. Then I heard a commotion from where the doe came from, and all of a sudden, a pure black seven-foot human ape stopped in his tracks. When he saw me and ducked in the brush, trying to go around, I packed my gear and ran home as fast as my feet could run. This looked like Bigfoot for sure. I'm a mail carrier in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Folks here are spread out over long distances, and they still need to get their mail, so every day I take a long drive out through the desert to deliver mail to the residents. In February 2023, I was out by the Valles Caldera National Preserve, and I blew a tire. It was late afternoon. It was going to be dark soon. The desert gets really cold at night, year, around. Even worse, cell phone service is spotty around here. My reception was nil. My only options were to wait for a car to pass and hope they were willing to help. I could also hike up the hill and try to get a signal. Eventually, after I didn't report back, the post office would send somebody out to find me along the highway. But that could literally take hours, and I didn't want to spend the night out here alone. I chose to hike. I could probably make it up and back just before dark. I just hoped that I would get a signal once up top. I was about halfway up the hill when I decided to take a short rest in a water break. I was sitting on a rock and taking a few sips from the bottle when I heard some odd sounds. It was like loud chattering. It reminded me of cicadas that I remembered when living in the eastern United States. It seemed like it was coming from behind a rocky outcropping directly in the path. I didn't see any other route, so I decided to just move slowly and see what it was. As I began to walk, I stepped on a loose rock and lost my footing. I slid down a few feet before catching myself. The chattering stopped and I noticed something move out from behind a boulder. I saw a six-foot tall, thin insectoid with the head of a grasshopper. It had two large antennas on its head and a pair of large pincers extending from its thorax. There was another smaller pair of pincers beneath that. It moved quickly left and then right and then left again, stopping twenty feet away. It was horrible. I didn't know if running and standing my ground was the best option, but after I took another look at its pincers, I decided on the former. I slowly backed away, mimicking its movements. It stood still as it watched me. Then my cell phone began to ring loudly. The creature's antenna snapped to attention, and it quickly ran down the hillside. I instantly ran in the opposite direction, stumbling and falling as I moved. I eventually reached the bottom of the hill near the roadside, not far from my mail truck. I hopped into the truck and stayed put, hoping that the creature would stay away from me. I did catch a glimpse of the creature as it moved around the hill. I stayed put in the truck for several hours, not daring to leave its safety. After what seemed like forever, a car came along and gave me a lift back into town. What the hell did I see? I have heard a lot of stories of strange creatures in the New Mexico desert, but this was almost impossible to imagine. Of course, I haven't mentioned this to anyone other than my girlfriend. During the summer of 2017, I found myself cruising through Fort Wayne, Indiana, as dusk began to settle in. It was one of those balmy evenings that make you yearn for adventure, and I decided to take a leisurely drive through the outskirts of town to clear my mind. The sun had already dipped below the horizon. My radio was playing an old crackly blues tune. 
It was the kind of evening that made you believe in the supernatural, and little did I know just how right that feeling would turn out to be. As I rounded a bend in the road, a strange unease washed over me. I couldn't help but feel that something was about to happen. And then, it did. Out of the darkness of the woods, a figure emerged, running on all fours with an eerie, inhuman grace. It was massive, its silhouette reminiscent of some monstrous creature. The creature sprinted towards the road, coming closer with each passing second. My heart raced as I slammed on the brakes. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was something sinister. The figure vaulted over the car in front of me, moving with a speed and agility that defied reason. I watched in shock as it landed on the other side, its form bathed in the glow of my headlights. And then, just as swiftly as it had appeared, the creature dashed back into the woods on the other side of the road, disappearing into the night. I was left sitting there trembling and bewildered, trying to process what I had just witnessed. It was the dogman, or so the locals called it. I had heard stories of this being, but I never truly believed in it until that moment. With a trembling hand, I finally put the car back into gear and continued my journey through Fort Wayne. So I wanted to share my story. I'm not 100% sure it was a crawler because it wasn't tall, but everything else matches up. I would also like to apologize for bad writing. This all happened in Lithuania. In 2016, I, female 14, was laying in the same bed as my younger brother and mom in her room because of the cold. Both of them had went to sleep while I stayed up, reading. The only light sources were my bedside lamp and a crystal rock lamp in an empty brother's room across from us for ambient. Having read enough, I closed my book and turned off my light, laying down on my side, facing the other room. And there I saw it. A pale, hairless, humanoid, bony creature, kind of looking like the one goblin from Lord of Rings or the Rake, except it was a medium dog-sized. It was hunched over and had sharp claws and toes, as well as sharp teeth. Its eyes were bright, orange, red. The creature was moving inside the room across the doorway, on two legs illuminated by the light. I got very scared and got up on my elbows, turned to look at my sleeping mom and whispered called her, yet she didn't react. Suddenly, from my moves, the bed loudly creaked and I snapped my head back at the creature, locking eyes with it, both of us unmoving. I blinked and looked at my mom again, calling for her, and when I faced the room again, the creature was gone, yet the image of his sharp, bright eyes stayed in my mind. Moving forward a year later, I was watching a movie with my brother in Mom's bedroom, and we heard a crash in his room's walk, enclosed. I decided to investigate what could have fallen. As I was walking to the closet, I saw a flash of white move quickly across it, the last thing being a white bony leg disappearing into a dark corner. When I moved closer, I didn't find anything, and nothing was out of place there. Years later, I'm still wondering what it was and have had a few nightmares about it. In 1977, I was between marriages working for the United States General Service Administration as a security officer in the San Francisco Bay Area and driving home from the California Gold Country in Sonora with my girlfriend. It was early October, around dusk, and the skies were clear. The sun had dropped behind the Wildcat Range as we drove east on SR-108-120, and the stars were coming out. We saw one brilliant star shining above the ridge, and I assumed it was a planet until it suddenly moved to the north several degrees. We looked at each other, and the word plane popped into our heads. It then moved quickly to the south and seemed to shimmer. There's no way for me to determine how far it was or how large it was. To me, it was still a brilliant object. We pulled over to the side of the road and watched the object shift north and south and upward with incredible speed. Two cars also stopped and parked behind us, and those occupants stared at the light. 
When the light show couldn't get bigger, the star split into five other objects. They were less brilliant, but still outshined the stars that were coming out. In less than a minute, all five objects sped away upward and to the south. One left some sort of trail. The group of strangers suddenly burst into applause, as I did. When I arrived in the next city, Oakdale, California, about half an hour or so later, I made a pay phone call to the sheriff's department and reported my sighting. The woman who took my call said, you and everybody else tonight. My girlfriend and I continued home and forgot about the incident. Until about a week later at my work site, my supervisor came up to me and said two federal agents of some sort were in the office and wanted to talk to me. I figured it might concern one of my criminal cousins at the time, so I was unprepared for their credentials department of the Air Force Office of Special Investigation, an organization I'd never heard of, and their request that I brief them on my sighting. I pretty much gave them the same report I gave to the Stanislaus County Sheriff's Department. One agent kept nodding and looking at papers taken from a briefcase. I was then told you were incredibly fortunate to see an amazing phenomenon of light, reflection, and weather. This is very rare. I remember those exact words because they seemed so ridiculous. I replied, no sir. I flunked meteorology in college, but I learned enough to know that's not what I saw. Light does not refract like that. His partner, and yes, they had dark suits, said something to the effect that what I saw was a natural occurrence, and that was the end of it. I remember saying, fine, so why are you guys here? I was told I was not to mention the event to anyone ever again. By this time, I was pissed. This was still America, and I had the right to talk about the weather if I wanted to, which is probably what I said. The first agent gave me a smile and said, Would you like to see the weather in Butte, Montana? A transfer can be arranged. At this point, I should explain that Butte, Montana was, is the dumping ground for federal agents, officers, security people, etc., who have screwed up very badly but couldn't be fired. Some considered it worse than Juneau, Alaska. I remember saying, Oh, now I get it. You just had to explain it to me. Sure, and I walked out. Any advancement in the Gassay disappeared that day, but my life turned out well without it. Now, as I slip into my 62nd year and poor health, I wanted to get my story out. Not very exciting. No aliens. No ships. But a moment in my life I have yet to forget. My story happened at Folcroft, Pennsylvania, right outside southwest Philadelphia, and you see a lot of freaky things where I'm from. But nothing made me act in a way that I did that night because I was not by myself. I had my cousin with me who was probably seven years old, and the danger alarm went off full force. There's a small wooded area nearby, and it connects to a water treatment plant that is connected to a nature reserve. If you look on Google Earth, you can see the woods connect and go all the way out to United State 1. I guess it's possible something could live there. There are plenty of deer. Well, we park and walk into the woods, and I got the feeling kids were down there probably underage drinking, just like we all did back in the day. Then I heard what sounded like a group of people talking, and I got down on one knee. Thirty feet into the woods on top of this hill that drops off. I can't really make it out, so I reach down and pick up a pebble. This will get a reaction, and I'll find out if it's people or not. So I wind up and heave it in the direction of the voices. Way down to the right of us, I hear a smack through layers of leaves and rocks hitting. Then ten feet in front of us, to my left, I hear this growl and breathing. It sounded like a human with water in its lungs, huffing and puffing right there. It vibrated in my chest. It was furious at me, whatever it was. I felt like I stuck my finger in an electrical outlet. Every hair on the back of my neck and my arms were standing on end. I calmly stood up, grabbed my cousin's hand, and said out loud, Okay, we're leaving right now. We turned 180 and walked briskly out of the woods. I never saw what this was. 
I remember as a kid that same feeling at the zoo when lions would pop off and flex roar. This incident still gives me goosebumps. Have I gone back down there since? No. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.